Welcome to this uh, one day workshop on what's the title of the workshop? The title of the workshop is The Unspoken Word. Forgive my ignorance of the title. I must confess that whatever title you give to these workshops, I say the same thing. I say the same thing because I have nothing else to say. My choice is limited. I want to tell you the truth. The truth does not change with season and with days and with location. It remains the same. So I have to keep on telling you the same thing. The truth is so vital for us, it bears repetition. So you bear with me that the truth that I say is the same every time. I try to look at the title and adjust some opening sentences and some concluding sentences to fit with the title. The middle is always the same. When I came in the 60s to this country and studied in this university, Harvard here, at that time people thought that I could speak on any subject. So they tested me out by giving me subjects at the last moment. Subjects just before I rose to spoke, they would tell me this is the, this is the lecture title of the lecture today. And I would speak and they thought that I had great wisdom and a lot of knowledge on so many subjects. I got away with that for a long time because they never realized that I was saying the same thing. <laughs> now, of course, they don't try that too often. Is there anybody here who was not present last evening at the lecture? Thank you. Is there anybody here who has never heard me before? Thank you. I have come to tell you something very simple. It's the simplest thing that I have ever come across. Nothing is simpler than that that the truth, the answer to your question lies within your own self, in your head, behind the eyes. That's what I've come to share with you. You want to find something, you can find it within yourself, behind your own eyes. There is a space behind our eyes. That space is located in the middle of the head. If these two fingers of mine represent the eyeballs, then placed like this, where these two fingers meet, is approximately the space inside our head. In that location, all the answers to all our questions are lying there, waiting for them to be discovered. You have to go nowhere to find the truth. It is inside you. All your questions have been answered, and the answers are sitting there. If the answers were not sitting there, you could not have a question. The questions come into your mind because of the answer sitting there. The answer comes first. The question comes later. So if you have any questions to ask, the answers are inside. Then why are you here? You should be inside your own head to get all the answers. You are here because you don't know how to get into your own head. That's the only reason. The only reason why you are in this workshop is you do not know how to access that space that wonderful space that exists in each of us. That particular space behind the eyes is the seat of wakeful consciousness. When we are awake, we feel we are there. Right now, if you want to experiment, you close your eyes and figure out where are you thinking from? Where are you conscious from? Where are you asking these questions from? Where are you talking from? And you will come to know you are, it's some space behind the eyes. It is precisely the same space I'm talking about. That point behind the eyes is the point from where we use these two eyes as eyes of perception of sight and put them together and we feel we are seeing one world. If we were sitting in the eye, we would see two worlds. The way we merge the seeing, the vision of the two eyes puts us in a position behind the eyes. We look out from the body, from our head, into this world, and we see we are seeing a whole world. We even forget that we are seeing through the eyes. The eyes are merely functioning as the receptacles of the vision, the sight that is coming in, falling on the retina, going through the optic nerve in the brain. None of these things are within our knowledge. 
Nobody who is looking outside is ever conscious where the optic nerve is. Nobody who is looking in the world is ever conscious where the retina is. Nobody is ever conscious where the pupils are. All we are conscious of is we can see a world with two eyes and we are seeing it as one world and we are merging the two eyes behind these eyes at the third eye center. Very appropriately, that position has been called the third eye. This has been so misused, this word third eye. One of the lamas, who was not a real lama, he was an American journalist, he ad adopted the name of a lama and wrote a book in which he described how they puncture a hole in the head and they drill a hole to find the third eye. The third eye somewhere inside and you have to drill a hole to see it. That author had the audacity to quote the Dalai Lama. His Holiness Dalai Lama to say he met him also in Dharamsala and he got the confirmation that this is the way to see the third eye. As it happened, I was with the Dalai Lama at that time in Dharamsala and no such meeting ever took place. So people write all these kinds of fanciful books talking about a third eye. It's not a physical eye at all. If you are not conscious, you don't have a third eye. This body does not have a third eye. The body has only two eyes. But when the body is inhabited by a living soul, by a living force, which makes this body alive, it has a third eye. The third eye is from which the living force, that consciousness operates in a living body. So that third eye is not a physical thing. You cannot cut open the head and find a third eye. Surgeons have performed surgery on the anatomy of this body. They never found a third eye. They only found the two physical eyes. The third eye is a functional, conscious seat from where consciousness can perceive this whole world and use these senses of perception, the organs of perception on this body. The third eye has also been called the seat of consciousness, the seat of wakeful consciousness. And different mystics in different traditions have used different words to describe that place. That place is so important if we do not access that place, there is no useful meditation that we can do. Has any one of you ever tried meditation? Please raise your hands. Any kind of meditation. Thank you. If you know what meditation is, meditation is the art of withdrawing your consciousness to the third eye. Any other kind of meditation keeps you roaming around in this world. Since we want to get out of the mess, mess that we have created in this world, we want to get out to our own self and have self-realization. A meditation that does not take us to the third eye is no meditation. On the other hand, a meditation that does not start with the third eye is also no meditation. True meditation, the art of self-realization, starts by first putting your attention on your own self, which is at the third eye. If you do not start with the third eye, you do not make any progress inwards. If you are fully at the third eye, you will hear a music the like of which you have never heard outside. That music which is part of our consciousness, that sound which is part of the consciousness, the sound which has been described as the nod in the Rig Veda, the sound which has been described as the word in St. John's Gospel, the sound that has been described as the Holy Ghost, the sound that has been described as the music of the spheres, the sound that has been described as the Shabad, the sound that has been described as the Subud, the sound that has been described as the resonance, that sound lies in the third eye center, in each one of us. There is no exception. It is not meant for some privileged few. That sound is in each one of us. Why don't we hear it? Because you can only hear that what is within your span of attention. Your attention is all outside at this time, picking up various things from this world. The attention has been allowed to be scattered by virtue of our desires and attachments in this world. As we desired various things, we got attached to those things. As we get attached to those things, those things draw our attention. And therefore, our attention has gone to all those things around the world. Even when we close our eyes in meditation, our attention is not inside. Our attention is going outside, all over the world. Every little attachment that we have had pulls our attention out. How can we hear what is at the third eye? If we can be detached from these various distractions of this world and sit peacefully behind our eyes, inevitably 
we will hear that great sound which is the basis of the spiritual journey. The spiritual journey starts from the third eye, hitching yourself onto that sound and with the sound going level by level from one stage of consciousness to another till you reach the totality of consciousness and discover you are the creator of the whole show. It's as simple as that. I am sure I am not the first one to come here and give the simple message. When I read the old texts of various spiritual literature in every language of the world that I know of, they have given the same message. They have said, go within and find the truth. This body is the temple of the living God. The truth is all within yourself. All these messages have been recorded again and again, but we haven't practiced them. Always reminds me of the story of the old woman in the Indian village who was looking for something under the light in the street. The village light in the street, she was looking to find something. And a young man came and said, ma'am, have you lost something? And she said, yes, I have lost my needle. I was stitching some piece of cloth and I dropped my needle and I can't find it. And the young man said, may I help you to look for it? She said, certainly son, come and help me. So he also started looking. After a while, he said, ma'am, do you remember exactly where you dropped the needle? She said, yes, I do. I dropped it in my house. He said, then why are you looking for it in the street? She said, I have no light in my house. This is not the story of the old woman. This is our story. We know the truth is inside. We know the truth is behind our eyes. But we close our eyes. It is dark there. So we don't look for it there. You open our eyes and start looking everywhere else. How are we different from that old lady? We are doing precisely the same thing. This truth is not outside. Outside is all a reflection. Outside is a projection. We are projecting a vision onto the screen, as I mentioned last night. And this screen will only hold the projection of what is being projected from the projector inside. You cannot alter anything on the screen. You go to a movie, you can't do anything by tearing apart the screen. It will still show the same picture that's in the projector. The film is there. It's being run. This life is constituted exactly the same way. The film has been picked up by ourselves from our own Akashic records, our own Akashic records from the causal stage, which is within ourselves. We picked it from there in consciousness, loaded it into the physical system. And now from birth till death, we are just watching the show. And we are thinking that we can change the show from outside. We can have a better relationship with somebody. We can argue out some, something. We can do things to people and do things. This is all programmed, predetermined, completely. What are we trying to alter things outside for? They'll never alter. If you want to alter your life, you have to alter by reloading the projector inside. The projector works at the third eye center and not outside. So I come back to the same thing. If you want the truth, you have to go within. Why do you want to ask questions from other people when the answers are with you? Find the answers inside your own self. In India, they say that without a guru, you can find nothing. Why is that? The guru is needed because we do not know how to look into the darkness. No other reason. More than a hundred years ago, Swami Vivekananda came to Chicago and spoke in the World Congress of Religions. Last year we celebrated his coming and again held a conference in Chicago to remember that great Congress. And we remembered the words he spoke. 101 years ago, Vivekananda said to the great Congress there, I have been telling you for these few days that this whole world is illusion. It's maya, mithya, not real. I have been telling you that everything you look at is unreal. Everything you listen to is unreal. The whole world is unreal. It's not made of real stuff. If I have been telling you that everything is unreal, then I must also be unreal because I am part of what you are seeing then my words must be unreal because they are part of what you are listening to. How come I am myself telling you everything is unreal and still making you listen to me? What is this contradiction? Then he gave the answer himself. He says it is true. Everything you are looking at is unreal, including myself. Everything that you can hear is unreal, including my words. With one difference. The rest of the unreality pulls you to itself 
and holds you there permanently. This unreality pushes you back into yourself and makes you see the unreality and thereby take you to reality. There's a conflict of one illusion and another illusion. This illusion, which we call a guru, which we call a master, is also illusion, is also temporary. But it has the power, the effect upon our consciousness to take us back within to reality. The form, the physical form of a guru that we see outside, the physical form of a perfect living master that we see outside is not real. It is born, is there and dies like everything else. But the real form of the guru, the real form of the perfect living master, which is part of our own consciousness, is real and forever permanent. The external form does not come to draw us out to the external world. The external form comes into our life to push us back into our own reality. Therefore, the true masters have never come to tell us, come follow us to outside places. They never lead us to different idols and stones and places of great importance and to temples. They have never done that. They have come to tell us that the real temple is your body. This body has been called the real temple. It has been called Nar Narayani Dei. That means the body in which not only the soul resides, but the Lord himself resides. Here is the whole temple is being carried by us. We want to go to a temple. We are carrying the real temple with us to go to an artificial temple made of stone. The real, the, these temples and churches and places of worship that were built were designed to imitate, to copy the real temple that is our body. Even the shape was copied. The kind of headdress they used to wear became the steeples on those old places of worship. The domes were the domes of the head. This was supposed to be the real temple. We copied it. We copied it to remind us. We, caught, we got caught up in the reminder. We forgot what they are reminding us of. Somebody touches one brick of a man-made temple and we are willing to come and destroy, actually kill the real temples that God himself has made. To what degree of folly can one fall? We come up to this level now. That we forget the real temple was the human body. is still the human body. And the truth has to be found inside. I want to emphasize that in this workshop, we must learn how to respect this temple. We must learn how to go within this temple and observe, observe the sanctity of a temple. We go to an outside temple, we don't even talk loudly. This is a place of worship. And what kind of gossip, what kind of scandal we put into this temple? Outside, we are very respectful. In India, we even take our shoes off to keep the sanctity of the temple. And here, we put all kinds of things, dead meat and all kinds of things, dead flesh of people. We think that it doesn't matter. It's just food we are taking. If we have to really enter the temple, to find the truth, we have to give the respect that this temple is entitled to. That is why these masters have recommended we should have very simple sattvic vegetarian food, destroy life as little as possible because life has to be destroyed to survive. This, this place is like this. This is a horrible place where life lives on life. In this physical plane, life survives on extinguishing other life. So what do we do? We try to extinguish this the minimum, the lightest load that we can take upon ourselves. Because every time we destroy life, we take on karma. We can't help it. Even if we take vegetables, we are destroying karma, destroying life and taking on karma. But we should take the least so that the impact on our meditational practice upon our self-realization is the minimum. This power of consciousness is life itself. Through that, we can discover the total consciousness and the origin of consciousness itself. We have to go back to that seat of consciousness wherever we are. We are in the physical plane. So the most easily accessible place is the door behind the eyes. That is the door that has to be knocked to get it into our consciousness, the stream of consciousness through which we can go to any higher level. This body has nine doors opening outside. The two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth, the two lower apertures, all these nine doors that this body has all open outward and establish our connection with the world outside. 
and they have constantly created links between us and the world outside. They have not created any links within. The link with our own true self within has come from the tenth door, which lies behind the eyes at the third eye center. The third eye center has been described as the tenth door also. So we have to find where the tenth door is and the rest of the journey starts from there. It is like going to an airport to take a flight. The tenth door is our airport from where we take our flight back to the true home, which is in a state of permanent and total consciousness, not in fragmented consciousness, not in pairs of opposites, not in this world of duality. In this workshop, I'll try to lead you on to that place, which is the starting point of all true meditation, the third eye center. If you can achieve that, I'll be very happy. There's a secret how to do it. That secret has been revealed by these masters from time to time to their disciples. The secret is basically this, that although consciousness is the ability to be aware, consciousness does not mean to be imminently or immediately conscious. That's called awareness. Consciousness holds all potential and possible awareness. Whatever you can be aware of is called consciousness. Even if you're not currently aware, it could be a subconscious state, it could be a superconscious state, you may not be imminently aware of it, it is still part of consciousness. But what you are immediately aware of is the awareness being drawn out of that consciousness. Within awareness, you are aware of this room, you are aware of what is going on here. Right now you may not be aware of something that happened this morning, but with memory you can be aware of that too. You may not be aware of what is going to happen later, but with intuition you could be aware of that too. But this awareness, the immediate contemporary awareness, is what we work with. Within this awareness, we have a powerful tool, the most powerful tool in which we can operate in current awareness, and that tool is called attention. We have the power of attention. We can put our attention where we like. That's the secret, the key to spiritual growth. That we have the power of attention which can move in current awareness and by using it appropriately, we can go wherever we want. If you want to put your attention on the flower sitting on the table, the flowers become most important. Everything else starts withdrawing the seeding. The power of attention is that whatever you put your attention on, that becomes more immediately as an experience, awareness of yours, the rest starts receding. It is this power of attention that is used in the spiritual experience of the mystics in order to reach the higher states of consciousness. The power of attention enables us to withdraw or project the attention where we like. Our schooling from birth till now, our education, our life in this world has taught us how to focus our attention on various things. We are taught to concentrate on the books, so we put our attention on the books. If we don't put our attention on the books, the book is in front of us, our attention is somewhere else. We don't know what the book is saying. When we put our attention on the page on the book, we know what the book is saying. So this attention is the one that picks up any information and knowledge wherever it is focused. We have been taught to put our attention on various things. And the more concentrated the attention is, the more easily we pick up that information and awareness. So the concentration of attention is the secret of all meditation. All meditation anywhere in any culture has been based upon concentration of attention. Now when you talk of concentration of attention, this ability to concentrate attention is an ability that varies with the state of our health. It varies with the state of our relationships. It varies with the state of our worry and fear. It varies with the state of our food. And what is in our stomach? Have you noticed that? If you eat a certain kind of food, your power to concentrate your attention changes. I sometimes give an example to people who, who ask me why they should be vegetarians. I give this example. If you kill a man and come back and try to read a book, if your normal speed of reading that book is say two minutes a page, or one minute a page, you go and kill a man, come back with that, with that weight on your head of having killed a man, that guilt, and then you read the page, it doesn't make sense, you can't even proceed a few lines. It takes a long time for you to get back to one minute a page. What has happened? 
that particular action of yours, that particular karma of yours has affected you to the point that your power to concentrate your attention has been lost, has been gravely affected. Now, if you kill a cat or a dog and come and do the same thing, it is still lost, but not to the same extent as a man. If you pluck a, an apple from a tree and then read, even then it is lost, but is very quickly recovered and the distraction is not so much. You can experiment yourself with a stopwatch and see that whatever life you extinguish has an effect directly upon your power to concentrate your attention. Since you have to extinguish some life to survive, you cannot live on stones. The metabolic process in the human body and all other living organism requires that life be extinguished to sustain other life. Therefore, why not deal with that kind of a food which extinguishes life of the lowest order, which has the least effect on our power to concentrate attention and the recovery time is the lowest. This is the real reason to be vegetarian. Of course, there are many other reasons too. You can be kind to the animals. You can, you can belong to one of the societies that protects animals. You can be a faddist. There are other reasons. But the real reason for a spiritual practitioner, for an adept who wants to get something out of this spiritual discipline and meditation is to eat such sattvic bhojan, such pure, simple food, vegetarian food, vegetarian also of the simplest kind, so that when one sits in meditation, the power of concentration is not impaired. At least it is as strong as you can make it in order to succeed in this meditation. Food has made a great difference, but so have other things made a difference. If you are worried about things, you can never meditate properly. Worry, W-O-R-R-Y, worry. You heard, does anybody worry here? I guess you will take it for granted. Worry is praying for failure. I saw it written down, very bold letters. We should write it down for ourselves. We, people say we want to pray. If you want to pray for failure, worry. It's a guaranteed successful prayer. Whoever wants to fail should worry. I have never seen any good reason for worrying. I think this is one exercise we do which is totally futile. Worry gives us nothing at all. Worry reduces our strength to deal with problems. We have to deal with problems. This world is full of problems. We are here because of problems. We have come specifically to deal with problems. We wouldn't be in this world. We wouldn't be in the human form if we had no problems. We have not come we could be a tree, just sit like a tree and have no worry. We decided to be human. If we decided not to be a tree and to be human, we decided because we want to deal with problems. We have come in this world, the purpose being to have a learning experience, to grow, to evolve. How can we have a learning experience if there are no problems? Problems are inevitable. Problems ought to be welcomed. Problems are what makes us human. We shouldn't run away from problems. But worry is not a solution. Worry is no solution for a problem. There was a nice man from India who lived in, uh, lived in San Diego for 50 years. Beautiful beard. I loved him. I loved him because his beard resembled the beard of my master. And I told him so. He thought I loved him for his words. I said, no, I love you for your beard. <laughs> it's beautiful, white beard. He taught me something extraordinary. He used to tell people, how to cope with problems. He said, our greatest problem is that we don't want to face problems. We want to run around them, skirt around them. That is not the right way. Because when we think we have evaded or avoided a problem, the problem comes up at the next street corner. And the problem never leaves us. We can only postpone a problem. It doesn't help us. Therefore, he advised that when a problem comes in your life, first meet it, then greet it, then beat it. Very simple formula. Deal with the problem head on. Hold it. It has to be dealt with. You have to cope with it. Hold the problem. Deal with it as best as you can. Get rid of it and move on. Don't get stuck with a problem and, and worry. If you have dealt with a problem one way or the other, supposing you have done the right thing, you will feel happy. Supposing you have done the wrong thing, you will get a second chance and do the right thing. That's how life is going on. But you should never worry, because worry leads to a lowering 
of our possi attention, po possibility of concentrating our attention. So worry is never good. Another thing that comes in the way of our meditation, of our sitting in the third eye center and making progress is doubt, lack of faith. If we are doubtful, will it happen or not happen? It doesn't happen. There was a man, that's a story I heard, a man bought a house on the beach, a lovely beach house with the, with the sea in front, nice view from the window. So he got up after moving into his new home, opened up the window, had a beautiful vision. And then he saw next to his house was a small hut and a little sadhu, a little holy man was sitting in that hut and the holy man walked out and he saw the holy man come out with a little bowl in his hand and he walked over the sea as if he was having a walk, right on the water, on the surface of the water. He was very surprised, how can this man walk on water? So baffled by that, when the holy man was back, he went out of the house, met him, he said, I saw you walking on the water. How do you do it? He said, oh, that's not no big deal. I do it every day. I have my morning walk on the water. He said, how do you do it? He said, I have faith that I will not drown. That faith of mine is so strong that I don't drown. He said, you mean I can also do it? He said, of course, anybody can do it. If you have faith that you will not drown, you will walk on this water. He says, can you take me along for your morning walk tomorrow? Said, Certainly, you come with me, we'll both walk together. This man was so fascinated. He called his friends. He said, tomorrow I'm going to demonstrate to you something you have never seen. I'll walk on this water. Their friends turned up. In the morning when he was going to walk on the water, he said, well, it's good to try this, but what if? So he said, I'll tie a rope around my waist. In case I cannot walk, somebody can pull me out. Of course, he drowned immediately. He dropped into the water as soon as he entered. The rope... And the thought that he might drown, drowned him. Faith is such a strong thing. Faith is the basis for good meditation. If we have no faith, what are we meditating on? It's not an experiment in maybes. It's an experiment on self-realization. We're trying to discover our own self. You're not trying to discover somebody else's self. How can we have doubts and still say we're trying to find our own self? Doubt kills the potential for meditation. There were two boys in a Bombay beach called Juhu Beach. Somebody might have heard of it, who've been there. And they used to go and run around on the beach. And there was a holy man who used to make little sand castles, little sand homes. But he used to make such beautiful sand homes, which these boys had never seen before. They were so beautiful, so pretty, that one day, one of the boys who had five rupees in his pocket, say five dollars in his pocket. He had five dollars in his pocket and he decided that instead of spending it on ice cream, which they had come out for, he'll use those five dollars to buy one of those sand homes. He went to the holy man and he said, can I buy one of those sand homes? He said, yes, have you got the price to pay for it? And the, he said, the boy said, how much is the price? The friend told him, don't waste your money. We've come for ice cream. You don't want to waste your money on sand. He said, no, no, no. I like this. Home. Don't worry. We'll take ice cream tomorrow. So he annoyed his friend, but he wanted to buy the sand home. The holy man said, the cost is $5. He took out $5, gave it to the holy man, bought the house, put it on a plywood and took it home. The other friend of his went on cursing him. You wasted my evening. You wasted my time. I never had my ice cream. I didn't come out for this purpose with you. Are you carrying sand in your house? What good is it? Anyway, in spite of all the dispute, they went away. At night, the boy who was so upset, who didn't have his ice cream, he had a dream. In the dream, he felt he was flying in the sky. And in the sky, he saw beautiful homes made out of lights, illuminated as if the very structure of the house was built upon light. The doors and windows and floor, everything was made of light. They were shining in the distance. He was amazed at that beautiful experience. He flew in the sky and went on seeing those homes. And suddenly it occurred to him that the shape of those homes was exactly the same as the home that holy man was making on the sea, on the beach. He said, that man was not an ordinary person. Maybe this is heaven. And he was drawing, taking his architectural plans from heaven and making those little homes. 
Then he saw one house up in the sky looking exactly like the one his friend had bought for five dollars. So he flew close to it and saw the name of his friend written outside. He said, oh my God, my friend got this house in heaven for five dollars. What a fool I was that I was fighting with him for ice cream. And then he woke up. But the impact of the dream was so strong on him. He ran to the house of his friend. He said, look, I was criticizing you yesterday for buying that house of sand for five dollars. I'm willing to buy it today from you for ten dollars. And the friend said, no, no, that's my house. You want to buy, go to the same holy man. Buy your own. Why are you bothering me? So this fellow ran to the beach to see if the holy man was still sitting there and he found him still making new homes. He said, well, sir, I want to buy one of these sand homes. He said, sure, have you brought the price to pay for it? He said, yes, here are five dollars. He said, but the price is five thousand dollars. He said, what kind of inflation is this? Last evening it was five dollars, this morning it is five thousand dollars. How can the price go up so rapidly? He said, my son, it's not because of inflation. When your friend bought this house for five dollars, he had not seen anything. You have come after seeing everything. He bought it on faith. You are not buying it on faith. When you do things on faith, you get a great bargain. I'm just telling you a story about the importance of faith. And although the story is interesting as a story, but you will find in terms of meditation that faith is a very strong thing. When you have faith, you have no doubt. When you have no doubt, you have no fear. Remember this, that fear comes from doubt. If you have faith, you have no fear. And if you have no fear, you go forward. So in meditation also, like in other parts of life, we have to move fearlessly. And when you see these perfect living masters who have achieved this enlightenment, you will notice one great thing about them. They are never in any doubt and they are never afraid. It's a great thing to be in this life without doubt and fear. And that comes from enlightenment, from knowledge. So these are the different parameters in which meditation works best. So if you can develop faith, how do you develop faith? Some people think that faith is a, a system of believing in something without seeing it. If you see it, it's not belief, it's not, it's not faith. It's an experience. Faith is to believe in something that you haven't seen. How do you believe in something that you haven't seen? Well, faith is created sometimes by our upbringing. Our parents, our elders, they tell us, oh, this is the truth, it is written in the book. So we started believing it. Or we go and hear somebody in the church, in the temple, and we start believing it and say it's the truth. That kind of faith is blind faith. It does not take our real doubts away. We hold that faith and we put it on one platform of our anticipation and our head. And underneath that, we keep on doubting. Was it really true or not? But I can't, I can't question. I'm not supposed to question. We suppress our questions with that kind of blind faith. But the questions still create doubts. And the questions still interfere in our meditation. So that kind of blind faith, which we pick up from traditional religion, from traditional cultural devices, does not help us in meditation. What helps us in meditation is real living faith. Faith that grows every day because our experience is adding on to that faith. That faith does not come because we have heard something or read about something from somewhere. That faith comes because we experienced a little and we know there's something more and the faith is there. Next day, little more experience comes and we know it is there definitely and faith grows. This little experience in our life that comes, it comes in everybody's life, but we ignore it. These little experiences, spiritual experiences that we have, we ignore it. Except when we have a perfect living master, a guru to guide us. Then it starts growing, becomes part of us. Because then we attribute it to our contact with that master. And then we can see the master's hand in giving us those little experiences. And then the faith grows and is a living faith. That faith helps a lot in our meditational practice. So a living faith is quite different from a dead faith belief, belief on a statement of somebody. Living faith should be based upon our daily experience. These are the parameters on which we can make good progress. Now, in today's workshop, you'll be able to see where your weak spots are, where you need to strengthen yourself to have better meditation, 
and gradually you will be able to find a way of concentrating your attention on yourself on the third eye center and hearing the music, seeing the light, that point is full of light, that music emanates light like nothing else does. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. So it is said. It's been said like this in every, every religion of the world. That if you are able to be single-eyed, if you are able to concentrate yourself behind the eyes, you will see a light that you have never seen before. And it's truth. It's not, a, it's not just suggested for the sake of uh, an, an example. It is true. It's literally true. The light that you see inside in meditation is so beautiful, so strong, it doesn't jar the eyes. And yet it's much more than any light that you have seen outside. And that light is inside each one of us. This light and this sound has been placed inside us, not by any particular human being. It's a God's gift to us. It's been given to every human being. Everywhere on this planet. It's not one particular sect that has been chosen to be given this light. But we have to access that light by being at the third eye center. The less the distraction, the less the attachment outside, the better our technology of drawing attention, the better our habits of food and not worrying and having faith, the more easily we get that light and sound within. This takes some time to practice because our lifestyles have been such that we have created roadblocks in our own progress. But we can, once we know what it is, we can remove those roadblocks one by one and eventually get the light and the sound within. Today I want you to try and practice a new thing. A new thing is not focusing your attention on anything, but withdrawing your attention to yourself. We have been trained to focus attention and this error we make even in meditation. People close their eyes and look at something in front. That is not their self. That is something in front of their self. People close their eyes and try to see what is in front of them. An image, a light, that is not themselves. All these focusing of attention takes you away from yourself. The real way of meditation is to withdraw your attention to yourself. How do you withdraw your attention? By the process of imagining. Imagine where you are. Because when we imagine where we are, that's where our attention goes automatically. Supposing we imagine that we are in this, behind this wall. If we imagine and strongly imagine we are behind the wall, what's actually happening? We are not behind the wall, but our attention is going behind the wall. This process of imagining where you are helps you to withdraw your attention to the same spot where you think you are. If you think you are behind the eyes at the third eye center and imagine you are there behind the eyes in the center of the head, the attention gradually withdraws to that point and you can see the light and hear the sound within. So that is the exercise we will be attempting today in this workshop. Any questions at this time? Any questions on what I have said so far? Is all clear? It's a great class, the best I have seen. <clears throat> okay, let's start the first session by simply being familiar with the space behind the eyes. You close your eyes and sit in a proper spiritual posture. According to the uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, text on the postures, there are 84 postures for meditation. But you can adopt your own. I'll tell you the principle on which the posture is based. Then you can find your own posture. The principle is that the posture of your body, the positioning of your body for meditation should be such that you do not go to sleep. That's rule number one. Rule number two, it should not be such that it aches and pains and therefore draws your attention to that part of the body. Be alert, but not too tight so that your attention does not go into any part of the body. The attention remains where it is supposed to be behind the eyes. Make a comfortable position on the chair, not going to sleep and close your eyes and now visualize where you are. Find out for yourself where you are. Explore the whole body. Explore the whole space inside and outside of the body and find out where you are. Find out for yourself that you, the seeker, the one who is seeking inside, where are you? Look around, move around, go everywhere 
and then finally localize yourself where you think you are, where you feel you are. Go around, move around in the head, go into the throat, go into the heart, go into the limbs, into the hands, feet, come up. Roam around outside the body and then ultimately find out where you are naturally situated. Find out where you are. Don't find out what you can see. Forget about what is in front. Forget about seeing things. Just see where are you seeing from? Where are you? Personally, self. Where is the self? Locate yourself. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look the side. Open your eyes. Look the side. Any problem in locating yourself? How many of you were able to find where you are? Please raise your hands. Thank you. How many of you still have difficulty just roaming around? Please raise your hands. Thank you. We are going to deal with every problem that comes to finding ourselves in this workshop. This uh, ability to be able to explore your own self is the ability to move your attention where you like. I'll do a little experiment with you, which I've done in the past with several classes, works fine, called the orange juice experiment. Any one of you done that with me? Orange juice experiment. You liked it? Yes. Okay, we'll do that. It helps us to move our attention in the body and thereby give us a practice how quickly we can go to the third eye center. So now I would like you to join me in doing an experiment in which we consider that our body is made of glass. It's like a glass jar. You know like a jar, you pour juice into it. Think that this body is made of glass and you have poured juice, orange juice into it. You fill it up to the head, it's empty, empty. We think it's full, but most of us will find that our bodies are quite empty, head particularly. So we, we pour this orange juice right to the top of our head. And in this body, this jar, the only outlets are the valves which can open in the fingertips and in the toes. When we press the fingers, when we press them, the juice goes out. When we release them, the juice stays in. So we are going to use this device to gradually vacate the body of the juice. That the body is full of juice right to the top. And we have to control the flow of the juice so that it doesn't all flow out. We have to control it stage by stage. In the first stage, we will allow the juice to flow out slowly by pressing the fingers till it reaches the level of the eyes. When it reaches the eye level, we stop. Then in the next phase, we drop it till it reaches the level when the tip of the nose is at the level. Then we'll stop. Then we'll, at the third stage, take it to the throat. And then we'll take it to the chest level, the navel level, the um, level of the bottom, and level of the knees, and ultimately vacate the whole body of the juice. Clear? We're going to do this exercise. It's an imaginary exercise. It won't really mess you up. There's no real orange juice we are using. It's all imaginary. And this, but you first assume that your body is made of glass. And it's fragile. Don't shake it. You break it. So be very steady. In this exercise, you have to be extremely steady. Not move your body at all. The only part of the body you can move are your fingertips in order to take the juice out. When you press, you will lower the level of the juice slowly. As drops come out from here, they'll gradually lower the level. So when they go below the waist, the torso, then these valves cannot have any function because they have gone down. Then the feet and the toes of the feet have to be used. You press them and let the juice go from the bottom. Ultimately, the whole body will be vacated and clean. Can we try it? Okay, let's start. Close your eyes, fill your body, which is all empty. Nothing is inside except the shell. The skin is made of glass and there's nothing inside. Fill this body with juice completely. In other words, imagine that you are made of glass and you're filling up this whole body with juice right to the top of the head. When you're completely filled up with juice, you show me, give me a sign that you have done it by raising your hand and lowering it. That means you have done it. 
close your eyes. When you're completely full of juice, raise your hand and lower it. Thank you. Fill it up completely. Thank you. Thank you. Complete body should be full to the top of the head with juice. Thank you. Hold the juice inside the body. Hold the juice right to the top. Don't let it fall. Keep your fingers not pressed so that they don't leak. Thank you. Okay, we are going to start a very managed, careful, regulated flow of the juice. Very slowly, press the fingers of your hands so that the juice starts flowing slowly, drop by drop, not too fast. When it comes to the eye level, stop. Very gradually, hold at the eye. No more. Don't let it keep on dripping. Stop at the eye level, hold it. Hold, hold at the eye level. Watch it, see if the level is at the eyes. Look at it, Are you sure it's at the eye level? Look at it. Now press the hands again. Very slowly, drop by drop, let it come down to the nose level. When it reaches the tip of the nose, stop. Hold at the nose. Hold. I'm going to introduce an intermediate stage at the lips or the mouth. Now you have to be very careful. Just a few more drops and it should stop at the mouth at your lips. Let it flow till it goes to the mouth and then stop. Very carefully. Stop at the mouth. Now press the fingers again and let it flow till it reaches the neck. When it reaches your throat and the neck, stop. Slowly, very gradually. Stop at the throat, hold there, now press the fingers and allow it to slowly go down up to the chest level with the armpits. Now the fingers cannot drain any more except through the arms, rest of it is in the torso. Now we'll drain one arm at a time. Start with the right arm. Press the right fingers only to drain the juice up to the elbow of the right arm. Keep the left one filled up. Right arm only. Stop at the elbow. Hold. Now switch over to the left arm. Drain the left arm up to the elbow. When it comes to the elbow of the left arm, hold. Now we do both arms together. Press both the fingers of both hands, all the fingers of both hands, and let the juice drain out completely from both the arms. Shake out the, shake out every drop of the juice from the arms. Completely empty. Shake your hands, shake your arm. So it's completely empty. See that there is no drop in the arms left. Now use the toes of your foot to drain the rest of the juice down. Drain it down to your navel, to the stomach level. And stop at the navel. Hold at the navel. Now again, press the toes of the feet and drain the juice right up to the bottom of the torso. Vacate the whole of the torso. Let only the legs be filled with juice. Everything else should be vacant. Shake yourself if necessary. So juice goes into the legs and there's nowhere else except in your legs. Now we'll vacate the legs one by one. Right leg first. Take the juice down to the knee level. When it goes to the knee, stop. 
keep the left leg full. Now we switch to the left leg, drain the juice up to the knee level. When it comes to the same knee level like the right leg, stop. Now press the toes and get the whole juice out from the feet. Make sure the whole body is empty, the whole shell, the whole glass is empty. Shake the glass that no drop of orange juice should be inside. Shake the whole glass, shake the whole body. There should be no drop of juice left in. Look at the whole body. If any drops are still sticking any part of the body, shake that part. Get it off. Examine the whole body again. If there's any drop of juice anywhere, shake it and get it out. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look this side. Open your eyes. Did you like this experiment? Who liked it, please raise your hands. Thank you. Those who didn't like it, please raise your hands. Oh, you all seem to have enjoyed it. Okay. Was there, is there anybody here who had a problem in controlling the flow of the juice at different stages? Were you all able to stop at the eye level? Or did anybody have a problem stopping at the eye level? Nobody. At the nose, mouth, throat, navel, torso, legs. Yes. When we left, squeeze the juice out of our right leg, from our right toe, I mean, the, the juice that was in the left thigh went over into the right thigh. <laughs> 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 That's sneaky. So that. You really were only draining, you were actually draining your left thigh out of your right toe. Ultimately, was it clear? <clears throat> were you able to shake off all the juice from the body? Or were some drops still? How many of you still had some drops attached to certain part of the body? Raise your hands. Thank you. It may interest you to know that those are the parts of the body where you have some problems. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a good exercise to diagnose yourself also. And uh, you will find as a side benefit of this exercise that you may feel better there after today. It's a wonderful exercise for that purpose also. But that was not the intention of doing the exercise. The intention was to give to you control of attention on different parts of the body. So that when I say in the next exercise, Imagine you are behind the eyes, it becomes easy for you to do it. That was the purpose. But of course, you had some side benefits. Now, those who had still some juice sticking into their glass bodies, what did you do with it? Anybody? Yes. Uh, you rinsed it out with water. You put water in. Yes. We are going to now actually explore the area behind the eyes, which is the third eye center. All the sensory perceptions that we have here, the senses that they operate here, are operating independently of the body. But we think they are, they are working because we have those organs on the body. The organs on the body do not have sense perception. It is consciousness that has the perception and uses these organs of the body to limit that perception to the body. These eyes that we have in our body do not see. The eyes by themselves don't see. We are sitting inside, therefore we see through these eyes. Please remember this, that the power of seeing is different from these eyes. The power of seeing is what can see a dream. We don't need these eyes for a dream. The power of seeing is what we can see in imagination. We don't use these eyes for imagination. Seeing is different from eyes. These eyes in the body do not see. But we have eyes in consciousness that can see. Those eyes that can see but do not require these eyes are called our sensory or astral eyes. We have a different ethereal astral body that has eyes. And those eyes are seeing. Even when we think we are seeing through these eyes, we are actually seeing through those eyes but through these. And therefore, we limit our vision 
to the eyes of the body. These eyes fixed on the body do not enhance our vision. They limit our vision. If these eyes are not working properly, we don't see properly. It's amazing. I got some surgery done in my eyes and I was sometimes baffled by the fact that how could I see things so clearly, 20-20 vision in my imagination, but not through these eyes. What is that kind of vision? You have 20-20 vision in eyes that you possess, that you use. You use them for your dreams, you use them for your imagination, you use them for astral journey, you use them for out of body projection. Those eyes are perfect. And these are not. When we start thinking, assuming, we can only see because we have eyes on this body, we limit the vision to these eyes. The same thing is true of every other sense perception. We have all our five senses intact. In an ethereal body, a conscious body, which is very fine, not material, not like this body. And that body is fitting inside this. And therefore making this body alive. We get the sensation, this is our body because that fits in. But that is more real. That body which fits into this body has a longer life. It was not born on the day this body was born. It has already grown up, fitted into this body. It had a separate life. It had its own birth, its own death, which will be much later than the death of this body. It preceded the birth of this, will succeed the death of this, and therefore has a longer life. The average life of this body is 1,000 to 2,000 years. This body's average life is 50 to 100 years. We can come into these physical bodies five, ten times before the astral body dies. So this is a small segment, a small chapter of our inner life of a body that has been seeing. The same body has been seeing before we were born here and still sees through this body. That power of vision, which belongs to our astral, ethereal self, is the actual power of seeing. So when we talk of imagining, we are really getting back into that body. Every time we say, let's imagine something, we're talking of an astral form. How can we see an imagination if the seeing was dependent upon these eyes? Now we are using that inner self of ours in order to move inattention behind the eyes. It's much easier that way. This is just an introduction to you to tell you that don't always think that this body is doing everything. This body is a house. We are housed in this body. The real self is housed in the body and once we are able to find our real self, I made you walk inside and say go all around. You didn't go all around with this body. You went around with your attention. You went around with your imagination. That imaginary body, which looks like pure imagination, is more real. Because it can exist without this. This cannot exist without that. If that leaves this, this dies. But even if this dies, that lives. How can it be called imaginary? The body that we are using our sensory systems in is more real. If I were to tell you, keep this physical body in your seat where you are sitting there on your chairs, walk up in imagination, come here, shake my hand and go back. Can you do that? Let's try. Okay, I'm going to sit here, stand here with my hand stretched. All of you, leave your physical bodies there. Walk, don't hurt anybody's toes. In any case, they won't be hurt. You're so light in that body. Walk with your imaginary bodies. Walk up to, uh, through this aisle. Walk only through this aisle. Don't fly on top of anybody. Walk up here, shake my hand, go back and sit down on your chair. Can you do it? Please do it now. After you have gone back and sat down, you can raise your hands to tell me, signify that you've gone back. Thank you. How did you do it? Have you ever experienced astral projection? Going out of your body? Anybody? Well, you all did it right now. You did exactly that. There is nothing else. I challenge anybody who says there's anything more than this in astral projection. You just did it. This body that which you walked with now in your imagination had all the powers of all the five senses. 
it could feel touch it could sm- smell taste touch walk do anything it had all the senses intact but it had no matter with it that is our astral self that self has preceded our entry into this physical body and is more real than this body but we have forgotten why does it look less real because the attention the conscious attention that went with this body was less than half of the conscious attention you kept in the other body that was sitting there you divided your attention if you had put 51% of your attention on this body this would have seemed as real as your physical body and the physical body would have looked like imaginary to you but you used maybe 5 or 10% of your attention in this imaginary body and left the rest there that's why you felt you were still sitting yes i had a hard time when you kept moving your hand or you shaking people i had a hard time at first but when you stop then i could do it then i could i could walk up to you visualize myself walking up to you shaking your hand and coming back but i had an awful hard time practice will make you perfect next time you'll find no problem even if i walk around okay i am going to do little exercise with you to show you the power of sense perceptions in the astral form which are more real more secure than the powers of sense perceptions in the physical body and that is done by your finding your space at a third eye center going behind the eyes sitting there and relaxing and enjoying yourself that's a beautiful space we all have it's the most wonderful place if you are ever sad you have a problem you have worry you have anything just go into that space relax and come out and everything is solved if you spend a few minutes every morning in that space your life will change is that beautiful now we are going to use all the sense perceptions in that space so that you know that it is not merely imagining something visually we are as it were being there when we are awake in the physical system in the physical body we get a feeling we are behind the eyes when we are not awake we don't have that feeling it is not that we are always behind the eyes when we are half drowsy and half sleepy we are not there we are below at the nose level when we are dreaming we are at the throat level we are not always behind the eyes it does not mean that in the physical body we are always sitting there it's a notional point the third eye center is not a fixed point it moves according to our level of consciousness when we are super conscious and we are flying in the astral region it floats above the eyes it does not remain at the eye level so this so called eye level as the third eye center is a temporary phenomena and only relates to our being physically awake like we are now now we are physically awake therefore our starting point is behind the eyes if you want to experiment you can do it tonight i suggest this to many of my friends that when you close your eyes and and don't do anything you still feel that your eyes are right where you think because the eyes are being associated with seeing we think we always see with these eyes therefore even when we close it somebody says where are you seeing from we still point to these eyes that is a notion we have because of our association with the body now when you're going to sleep tonight after you are half asleep just feeling drowsy about to sleep you first touch these eyes like this and know where they are then leave them and when you are half drowsy again try to touch the eyes and you touch your nose it does not mean that your nose is now the eyes but you will feel you are touching the eyes why are you touching the lower part the actual focal point of consciousness in the body shifts it lowers itself during sleep but when you are dreaming if you had the power to touch your eyes of the physical body while dreaming if you have what are called the virtual dreams or real life dreams where you feel you are awake and you are also in touch with the dream if at that time you want to touch the eyes of the physical body you will touch the throat and still think you are touching the eyes because you will still feel you are looking out at the dream from that level that level in the body changes and therefore it is not true that it is always behind the eyes but for spiritual growth to take place for spiritual journey to take you higher up you must not go below the eyes 
it's very easy for this for the attention to drop below the eyes that is why many of the yogas that people teach the yogas of the six centers of the six chakras below are easy to follow because there the eye the level of the consciousness drops rapidly to the heart center it drops rapidly because we are used to it we are used to this direction and therefore it becomes easy we relax in a tranquil mode we feel very happy and go to sleep virtually in a samadhi in a state of samadhi all we are doing is going into nice little sleep at the lower chakras we not realizing that we do this all the time anyway every night but to get enlightenment to get knowledge to get answers to our questions we should not go into that samadhi but stay awake and more awake we should have more knowledge more information when we are in a state of enlightenment not less therefore you should not go below the eye level to hold on to your eye level you have to build a nice imaginary floor so you don't slip through if it is all woolly you just go through if it is watery you go through make a strong platform make a strong little platform imaginary platform behind the eyes when you close your eyes look at the floor then pick up a nice chair or a rug or a mat whatever you like or a carpet whatever is a nice asana nice place to sit on for you spread that or put that chair on that strong floor so that you stay there during meditation then sit in that chair relax choose the very best furniture you can buy because today it is free you don't have to pay for it choose the best and put it there and sit on it relax have a nice side table next to your chair a small table next to your chair so you are relaxing there the table is there and lot of goodies can be placed on those tables the idea of putting the goodies is to give you an experience of other senses like taste and smell so on that side table place a a pot of flowers or a vase or vase of flowers put a vase or vase of flowers and choose the best flowers get from the best florist that you know or order by wire to deliver straight into the third eye center put them on the table next to you and then on the same table put a dish of your most favorite goodies any snack any food that you like best put that there keep it there and during this exercise we are going to do now when i tell you you pick up the flowers and smell them and put them back and when i tell you you pick up that dish taste it eat it and put it back let's see how you experience it it's purely imaginary you're just going to do it in your imagination but do it at the third eye center nowhere else stay awake stay at this level and stay in your beautiful chair and then do this exercise is it clear any questions okay choose your own nice food and your nice flowers close your eyes imagine you are sitting behind the eyes in imagining you are behind the eyes test it out see with your own hands uh, is your forehead in front of you are the ears on your side is the back of the head behind you are you in the center center yourself as best as you can physically and then make the platform and sit in the center don't look at yourself sitting in the center you sit on the center feel that you are sitting there don't look at yourself sitting there because if you look at yourself sitting there you are not there you are at the point from where you are looking and looking all around 1 2 3 4 open your eyes open your eyes look this side did you have a good party how many of you were able to see the flowers and smell them please raise your hands thank you how many of you were able to see the food and eat it thank you how many of you liked this experience thank you you seem to have enjoyed it did any one of you see the flowers that you intended to see or were they surprise flowers anybody got any surprise flowers yes you who got a surprise i, I saw glad oats and then it was my american beauty rose that i it changed i don't know why but and then of course i love the smell of the roses but i was i was surprised that it changed on me was the smell okay in the rose 
Did you oh, smell? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Good. Yes. Probably yes. changed because the gladiolus don't smell. That's probably it. That's and right. That's, and and I thought, oh, oh, you know, and then I've had uh, the roses. So that's that. Was good. good. Yeah. Yes. They were odd shapes, different shapes. They were green outline with purple inside. Just, I've never seen anything like them before. So. You never seen those before. But were they good? Good look? Yeah, they were Pretty? nice. They had a nice smell. What kind of smell did they have? Uh, I don't know. Kind of like a lilac almost. Soft a... smell. Very soft smell. Yeah. Anybody else had some strange flowers? Some nice smell in the flowers? Yes. Oh, yes. You like that, isn't that yeah, your favorite? Like, yeah, my favorite flower. Was good smell? Yeah, very nice. You could smell it? You, it's still there? Yeah. It's still there? Yeah. Oh, good. I didn't smell it like I would smell in the, on this dimension. It was almost like a visual phenomenon. It was like a, a pattern. So the smell and the vision combined. That, that's right. That's okay. Okay, what about the snack? Did anybody get some good, good food? Any? Yes, there at the back. No calories? That's one good thing about this food. There are no calories in them. Was it tasty? Oh, it tasted delicious. I haven't had that since I was a year child, Brad. Really? That's great. That's a good snack. She got a good snack she hasn't had since childhood. She had a good snack and it had no calories. I want to tell you something very interesting. That in our astral form, in our imaginative form, in our sensory form, in the form in which we have all the senses intact but not this body, we have no weight and we have no weight problem either. We have no calorie problem. We have a life in which none of these worries that we have created in the physical body exist and yet all the sensory systems are completely intact. It's a great life. What about the snacks? I want to know a little bit more about what you ate. Did you get some real good? Yes. I had chocolate truffles with macadamia nuts in them. They were wonderful, but I started to worry they were going to melt in my hands. <laughs> so the hand didn't get soiled, did no. it? Okay. No, you didn't want this. It was not for you. You are happy because you have you have crossed this stage earlier, so you don't have to worry. You will get happiness. Enjoy your happiness at the third eye level. That's good. The idea of this experiment was not to f serve free meals. <laughs> the idea of the experiment was to show you that in our consciousness we have the ability to have these sensory experiences without the use of this body. And these sensory experiences are coming from somewhere and later on in meditation you will find out that the source of those sensory experiences is also the source of all our life experiences. That where that experience comes from is where the life's experience is also coming from. And therefore, it's all within our hands. We just set up one particular pattern and that's why we are in this life. It's got a deeper meaning. You were able to touch, taste, smell and see. All these things you could see in this little experiment. Yes. Is an inch uh, your consciousness traveling to that part of your body? I mean, other than a <laughs> mosquito bite or something. Oh yes. It is. It's a tactile sense also. Yes. But I mean, it's the concentration is brought to that spot and then you go and scratch it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. All the experiences of the body are the experiences being projected, attention going to that part of the body. Yes. Back several minutes ago, you asked us to look around, close our eyes and look around and find out where we are. And I could feel like my attention going around and coming to a place where I figured I must be, but there was nothing there. There was no light, there was no music, there was no sign on the door or anything that says this is it. It just had a, uh, I, I figured I must, that must be it, but there was nothing recognizable to tell me that I had made it. Is there something that, that comes through meditation that you can know when you are at the third eye? Yes. Some, yeah. some sort of a, a way to know that you're here now, you can go ahead and, uh, and be there. Yes. You're not getting there. 
You know, that's what I mean. No. Yes. What you discovered was deductive. Right. My mind thought. Exactly. It must be. Exactly. It was not real. It was not real. It was deductive. That means your mind said, well, what else can it be? It must be. Therefore, it was pure a mental gain. It was not being at the third eye center. When you will be at the third eye center, the light and sound will come automatically. And you will not have to deduce that you are there. But it was only an experiment in trying to move our attention at will. If we can move our attention at will, then it becomes easier to reach the third eye center. But when you reach the third eye center, it will automatically give you a light that you have not seen before. And we will come, come to that. The mind is constantly guiding us. The mind is our great companion and we have relied upon the mind all our life. That is why what the mind tells us, we start believing. So this was a deductive experience of the mind. The mind said, what else could it be? It must be this. That's exactly how the mind is telling us all about the rest of our life. In fact, it may surprise you that in this world, through the physical systems, when we think we are seeing anything, we are not seeing. The mind is telling us, you are seeing this and we believe it. Did you know this? Did you know that all the senses are operating on the power of the mind to be a narrator of what's going on? The mind is telling us, you are seeing this and we say, yes, we are seeing it. The mind says, now you are hearing this and we say, yes, we are hearing it. The mind says, you are touching this, so we say, yes, we are touching it. The sensory per perceptions per se mean nothing. We see just blobs of color and shapes, they mean nothing to us. The mind says, you are doing this, you are doing that. All these, all these sense perceptions are being interpreted by the mind to make it a living world. So the mind is performing this role of creating a universe for us. The sense perceptions themselves are dependent upon the spoken word of the mind telling us and the soul consciousness listening to the mind and thereby having sensory experience. Maybe I'm making a statement above my own head, but you examine it. You examine this, that all our sensory experience of this, they do not exist in reality. The illusion is that the listening power, which is real, it goes right up to our heaven. That listening power of the soul, the listening power of our consciousness is made to listen to a mind which comments upon what's happening and makes the five senses possible. It's a deep stuff, but you think over it sometimes. Okay, coming back to the third eye center. Yes. What, what that day then? I desired, I love homemade, uh, the uh, old fashioned turn uh, ice cream. And I, was it the desire that it came to me? Or, I mean, explain to me what happened. That's what I had. Is your good ice cream? Oh, wonderful. Is wonderful. the taste still there? Yes. In your mouth? Yes. Do you enjoy it? What else do you want to know? <laughs> is it bad or good? Or, I mean, tell me, what tell me, happen? here is ice cream you had. You paid no price, you got no calories, <laughs> and you still want to know if it is good. <laughs> you got a free you got a free snack with no calories and enjoyed with good taste. It has to be good. Anybody has a different opinion on it? If you can get a good tasty snack which you really enjoy and which has all the taste that you want. It's so good and there are no calories and no cost for it. How can it be not good? You had a good experience. Don't worry about it. Okay. The idea. Yes. I can visualize myself eating the snack, but to visualize the taste and actually taste it is difficult. Visualize a sense and make it happen. You are not visualizing yourself tasting anything. You are visualizing an object that you create, which you think is yourself. And then you make that object eat. You won't get the sense. You did not try eating yourself. You made an object you called yourself and made that object do it. Is that true? So therefore, it was not your experience. There was a little error that crept in. The error was that you thought what you were seeing was you. That was not you. Who was you? You was the one that was seeing. When you saw yourself there, 
that was not you that was the object of your seeing who was you the one who was seeing where were you you were behind that you were not even at that point where you saw that was in front of the third eye not at the third eye understand my point you are the one that saw not the one that was the object of your sight so you made your own image sit in front of you that was not yourself that image does not have the power of taste that image does not have the power of smell how could it smell but you had the power the very one that was seeing that image could have smelt so you do it again next time it will work okay <laughs> all right uh, i want to point this out uh, that uh, very often we make the mistake that we start seeing a little part of ourselves and think there i am sitting at the third eye center that little object we see is our own creation we just make it we are not there that little image that we see of ourselves is in front of us that's how we are seeing it in front that's not us if this happens in your meditation that instead of feeling that you are there you start seeing yourself there pull back to the point where am i seeing this from that's the third eye center yes you talk about detachment we are not we have to detach ourselves from the world and see it for real and this connects with what you're saying now because um, what you're saying i think is that when we go out into the world and look into the world we are seeing the world through our own description of the world and not seeing the world fresh for the first time every time we see something so uh, the object is if i'm listening to correctly is to self refer back to that third eye back to that pure being see the world with pure being and in pure innocence and um, see we see the world fresh and not see the world through our description of of yes we know that's a table or yes like last night oh that's a picture i've seen that before instead of just really looking at it fresh and saying you know uh, like a baby sees and everything's alive it is real you know, often times we go through life and or through day and uh, we wonder what happened that day because we describe the world as we see it and we're not seeing it through truth seeing it through our own mind correct congratulations you not only you know not only i communicated well with you even what i have just to say little later on i have already communicated with you which is another aspect of what i'll talk to you about thank you thank you for sharing these exercises are supposed to tell us the methodology of meditation how we can imagine we are at a certain place and actually be there in attention the attention can gradually concentrate it does not mean the whole of attention goes there we have scattered our attention we have scattered our attention through these apertures and through the relationships we have built in this world you will find it out in meditation things will come in front of you which you thought you have forgotten things will come into your mind which you thought are just past events but you are still attached to them those attachments will come like pictures and float in front of you whatever you think of as an association with outside things the same pictures come so they block your vision and they block your experience of the third eye center it is these distractions that we have created by our desires and attachments with outside things which we think are real we think all these outside things are real and we have attached themselves so they block our effort to put our attention at the third eye center consciously we may not know at that time that this is happening but as we progress to know ourselves those distractions come in front of us and don't let us stay there you will find that once in a while you can jump into that beautiful space called third eye center but then you quickly go away pulled by a distraction that takes you away depending upon your own attachments of the past so gradually you will come to know that this world of illusion is not worthy of attachment when that happens your ability to stay at the third eye center will greatly enhance and you'll be able to stay at will whenever you like it comes by practice and comes gradually yes sure when i meditate at times 
I will be in the third eye center and then my mind will shut me down. Just take me right away, just that quick. I don't get a, an attraction, but just my mind just takes me out of it. Does anybody else have this problem? Raise your hands, look back. <laughs> this is so common. This is the problem. I want to summarize. Summarize the problems in meditation. This is the summary of our problems in meditation. Our mind, period. I just summarized. <laughs> we have no other problem. I want to give you another uh, summary statement about the spiritual path. Between us and God, there is nothing else but our own mind. That's all. There's no other wall. There's no other barrier. We created it with our mind. And we are now tackling that the biggest problem is that we are tackling the problem with the problem. We are tackling the mind with the mind. We have no alternative. We have no option. Here is the front piece. You know, there is a attention is the front face of consciousness. Awareness is the total face and the eyes of consciousness are attention. So attention is very important. Similarly, mind has its front face. The mind's front face is thought. Thoughts show that the mind is there. And ego, I am thinking. I is the eyes of the mind. The ego is the mind functioning effectively in our life. So when I say, I am doing this, I want to do it, I want to do it, we are putting the mind up front. And that is the obstacle between us and our creator. That is the wall between us and our truth, our own ego. The difficulty is that the solution to this problem of ego is to be found in ego itself. The seeker has to be the same I. The seeking has to be the same I. The meditation has to be done by the same I. So the I is the problem and I is the solution in a slightly different way. So this is the, this is the whole thing about spiritual meditation. How to tackle the problem of our ego and to tackle the problem of our mind, of our thoughts. The ego is a problem when it separates us from the rest. The ego is a solution when it does not separate from the rest. I'm giving you very simple statements to examine. You can examine them later on also what it means. When we say, this is my house, I am declaring by that statement, the rest are not mine. I'm separating. When I say, this is my car, I'm not really saying that. I'm saying all these other cars are not mine. When I say this is my body, I'm really saying none else belongs to me. When I say this is my space, everything else is foreign to me. What am I doing by doing this? I'm limiting myself into a little corner. God gave me the whole of creation. God gave me the experience of life, the whole experience, the entire screen. And I chose to corner myself in a little spot and say, this is mine. That's what the mind has done. God didn't give us that experience of mind. He gave the whole experience. It was a show. Take the whole show in. And the mind chose to confine itself to a small corner. That's the problem of the ego. When the ego turns around and becomes a seeker of the truth, says, this is my consciousness, my totality, my God, my creator, my creation, that I identify with all. It's all me expressing in such a drama. The ego becomes a solution, not a problem. So the switch from the ego that is negative and separates you to the ego that is universal and joins you is the spiritual path. All these things we are doing, different methods, are to reach that end. The end is to understand that this creation is taking place in one consciousness, and that is the self. The whole show is taking place only in one consciousness, and that is the self, and that is the creator, and that is everything. There's nothing outside of it. But we have, through these illusions of separation, through the illusion created by our ego, separated ourselves, made ourselves small, pygmy, little, miserable, horrible. We created it. We made a mess of our own grand style of living in consciousness. We lost that style and became so messy ourselves. We did it. Who helped us to do it? 
our own mind. We didn't need anybody's help. Nobody came to make a mess of our life. We did it within our own self by using one little companion called our mind. We kept the company of our thoughts and our mind and our ego, and this is what we made of our life. <coughs> Leave this company, turn it around, make him more spiritual, make the mind more spiritual, make him your friend, not your enemy, and the whole life changes and becomes spiritual and becomes fulfilling and happy. So it's a real kind of dealing with one's own mind. There's nobody else creating problems, and there's nobody else who need to be tamed to make the problem disappear. It's our own mind that's doing all this. Any other question? Yes. How did you begin to teach a child this information? How By living. You, how do you begin? By living it. By living it as, a as an example. 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 Nothing is more effective on a child than an example. When you teach something to a child and your life is different, you mm -hmm. teach nothing. This is our greatest mistake. We are hypocrites to our children. We lead a different life and we teach them something else. That's why they never learn. Don't try to teach your children. Treat them like your friends and be examples to them. See how quickly they'll come on the spiritual path. Any other question? Yes. Well, is this what you mean by becoming one with the universe and what touches one touches all? Right. right. In truth, that is what the truth is. But we have separated ourselves to the mind and you don't get that universal experience. Okay, let's now explore the third eye center. And don't do those other things. You don't need any more feast. You had your snacks, you had your flowers, you had your smell. Now have yourself. Experience yourself. Close your eyes and be at the third eye center. And do nothing. Just be there. Learn to be there doing nothing. And don't think of anything. If you want to think, think of that place. Think of how it looks. Look in front, but don't run after what comes in front. If any images come, if any figures come, let them come and go. Don't move from your chair. Hold on with your hands to your chair so that you don't walk away. Because our tendency is to walk after anything that comes in front of us. You will find that out. Don't walk away with anything. If things come in front of you, just stay in the third eye center behind the eyes. To start, once again, you can use your hands to determine by closing your eyes where your hands, by feel, by tactile sense can show you. Are you in the center? If you are in the center of the head behind the eyes, you are fine. Stay there. Imagine you are there. Don't imagine that you are seeing yourself there. Imagine you are there. And when you are there, stay there. Have an association with a chair or something that you can hold on to. And be there. And let things come and go. Ignore them. Any sounds come, ignore them. Listen to them from a distance. Any visions come, any light comes, ignore it. Don't follow anything. Just stay in the center. Close your eyes and begin. Do. Three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look this side. Look this side. <clears throat> Are you all back? Anybody had a good time? Raise your hands. Oh, good. You enjoy yourself? Any questions? You understand what we are doing. We are only trying to practice the withdrawal of attention at the third eye center. Yes. Your advice for a hyperactive mind is to just try and ignore it and distance from it? Yes. Ignore it. Let it hype. You enjoy your peace. <laughs> That's a big statement to make that you can deal with your mind on that basis. That mind, you do your thing, I'll do mine. Which means you already identified yourself as yourself, not as the mind. Which is one of the biggest problems in, in this life. That we identify ourselves as the mind, then we have problems. When we can tell the mind what to do, half the problems are solved. So even in meditation, you can tell the mind to be hype. I just watch you doing your antics. I am not involved. And you are at peace. Yes. What is the purpose of a mantra? We are coming to that next. The purpose of the mantra is to prevent the mind from doing what it was doing in, in the case of most of us now. They aren't telling me, but I know. The mind keeps on speaking different words. You want to block that with mantra. We'll come to that next. 
Yes. It's natural. There's so much energy in us, so much energy. It has to flow through us. It flows through the body, it flows through our systems, it flows through senses. It also flows through consciousness. But we should hold ourselves there and not go with the flow. If you go with the flow, you sink to the different chakras. If you hold there, you get more of light and sound. Just hold behind the eyes, don't go down with it. First of all, you made a comment about ego in animals. Animals have no ego. No, they have instinct. The instinctive response that the animal takes is uniform, consistent. The animal wants to dig, it will dig. Nothing will stop it. It's the human being, you say, today I want to dig, tomorrow I don't want to dig. The choice that the human being exercises is the ego. Animals don't have it. Human beings want to use free will to make decisions different and inconsistent with each other. That's where ego shows up. So ego is different. Secondly, ego is the front piece of the mind. It's not the whole mind. The whole mind is behind it. Just like attention is just the front of the consciousness, not the whole consciousness. So far as your problem of how to deal with the situation that we are confined to, this is my house, this is my house, this is my car, my body, as yet we want to have a universal approach. What is the practical way? You cannot list all the things in the world to make them your own. It's not practical. You cannot even be aware of all the things that exist. It's not practical. One thing is practical. We believe that God, the creator, created everything and all belongs to him. Why not belong to him? Then everything becomes ours. The practical way to adopt universality is not to start picking at the different things to say, I'm going to make each one of them my own. The practical way is to be one with the one who is already having all of them. And that's your God, that's your master, that's your Lord. Identify with him. If I belong to him, everything becomes mine. It's a practical way of doing it. Any other question? We'll come to mantra and dhyan and other methods after lunch. Did you eat as much as I did? <laughs> Boy, this meal is much worse than the one we had earlier. This puts on weight. <laughs> this physical food is uh, heavy stuff. And the spiritual food is light. That's very beautiful, light, spiritual food. If we have more spiritual food, believe me, you will need less of the physical food. The more one eats the spiritual food inside, the more one drinks the nectar flowing inside, the less we are dependent upon the food outside. We need much less food, much less sleep, much less air, much less of any of the physical necessities if we are enjoying ourselves spiritually inside. That space is so beautiful there. So try to spend more time there and you'll be able to get a lot more out of spiritual exercises. In the pre-lunch session, I was trying to introduce to you the space behind the eyes, the third eye center, where all the secrets lie, where you can get all your answers. I made it sound too simple. I made it sound like we just close the eyes and we are there. We are not there. We are everywhere except there. Our thoughts are scattered. Our thoughts keep on taking us all over the world. Whether we like it or not, we think when we want to, we think when we don't want to. We think when we are awake, we think when we are asleep. We never stop thinking. And because we keep on thinking, we are constantly scattered and are never by ourselves. That is why these masters, when they told us that the royal road to spiritual heaven was within yourself, they also told us it's very difficult to be within. That there are certain obstacles coming your way and they are because of your mind. You will notice them as soon as you start going within. These obstacles are created by our own mind and our own thought process they become obstructions to spiritual salvation and spiritual progress. What are these three? There are three main obstacles we have to encounter. One, when we are trying to be in meditation behind the eyes, the mind keeps on speaking in thoughts and those words of thought take us away from the third eye center. That's the first obstacle. The second obstacle is, while we are trying to sit behind the eyes, 
the mind shows us pictures of our children of our beloved ones of our relationships of our friends of our enemies of those who used to be friends are no longer friends of those who used to be friends are enemies now and some rarely some enemies who have become friends but some picture or the other we are constantly seeing other faces of people how can the mind sit behind the eyes and thirdly when we sit here i don't know if you noticed there was a small song going on far away did anybody hear, hear it see these little noises can be heard all over these little sounds of this world become so loud the deeper you go into meditation the more distracting even little sounds of outside become in fact there is a japanese philosopher who says that you can never be entirely silent because this world has no silent spot everywhere you go in this world there is some sound going on and you if you don't believe it do meditation you will hear it it's an external sound who oh, he he set up just 20 miles outside of tokyo a small sound proof box a little cave like the old yogis used to use in india he set up an artificial modern electronic cave in which you could sit you could breathe and you could hear no sound but he found there was a big problem because the sound of your own breathing was so distracting you couldn't concentrate on the third eye sense he found that even if you block out all sounds the minutest sound becomes so loud that there is no way to be inside here are three big obstacles how can we sit at the third eye center when our thoughts keep on speaking and take us away the images coming in front of us keep on distracting and taking us away and the various little sounds of this world keep on coming and take us away these three distractions have to be tackled before you can make any progress in meditation so the mystics and the masters they evolved a technique a methodology to overcome these three obstacles the first the obstacle of the thoughts coming in and distracting us was solved by a method called the use of a mantra what is a mantra a mantra is repetition of words which are not your thought repetition of those words which are not your thought becomes a substitute for the words of your thought it is like you are squeezing your thoughts from inside from this chamber and pumping in words of another kind and thereby eliminating the first major distraction so mantra is used as a means of clearing your thought stream of the thoughts that distract you and putting in those words which have no external association for you what is a good mantra a good mantra is that which when you repeat does not associate you with anything outside in this world otherwise repeating any word will clear the thought stream supposing i like uh, pepsi cola and i keep on saying pepsi cola pepsi cola of course all other thoughts will be cleared but pepsi cola will keep me out because pepsi cola the word associates me with the drink that i take outside so therefore every word does not act like a mantra If you repeat a word that has an association of ideas with something in this world it is not a good mantra Now that's the rub we know of no word which has no association with this world In fact all our la language all the words that we ever learned were based upon association of ideas with that sound with something in this world That is what gives meaning to those words The meaning of a word is what it is associated with and all association is outside how can we coin our own mantra it's very difficult hence the need for a guru to give us a mantra the need for a master to give us a mantra and to give us words which have no association for us with anything external to ourselves so the master can pick up words which have some relationship to an experience which we will find out was internal but no connection with any experience that is outside if the master knows that there is a certain sound inside which can be described in a word which he has used for that sound and he gives that word to us it becomes an effective mantra because when we repeat that word not only it clears our thought stream from other words eventually the same word begins to ring in us through the universal mind and give us the same meaning that the master had so it takes us within and not outside 
So mantra is a very important part of the methodology of the mystic practice in order to overcome the first obstacle. The second obstacle of these images coming in front are solved in the mystic methodology by dhyan. Dhyan means contemplation. Just like you can substitute the words of thought with a mantra, words of mantra, you can substitute the words, you can substitute the images that your mind makes with an image of your choice. And you can make an image of, you can make an image of God. That's the best thing to do. But nobody has seen God. How will you see, make an image? So the next best is we make an image of a person who we associate with God. And that's the master. A master's image coming in front blocks the other images and therefore is a good vehicle for dhyan, for contemplation to, uh, to take the second kind of distraction away. Here I must mention one thing that when I talk of a master whose image you bring up, I am not talking of a photograph. I am not talking of a painting because a painting is still an external thing and a photograph is still an external thing. A human form is still an external thing. But when I talk of a master, I am talking of one whose enlightenment makes that master operate from our own inner self. Therefore, it has to be a perfect living master. A perfect living master, if you contemplate on the face of the perfect living master, it blocks out these images that distract you outward. What about the little sounds that distract us? The solution to that is to hear the inner melody, the inner sound, the sound that comes out of your own consciousness. That sound is there in each one of us. It's a great sound. It's a sound that resembles the sounds outside, but is far more melodious, has much greater rhythm and much greater resonance. There are many sounds we can hear, but the opening sound which has a pull and takes us up is the sound of a big bell. Did you know that when we not only copied the head when we designed the temples and the churches and our houses of worship and put the domes and the pinnacles on them, we also designed the sound to fit in with the sound we could hear inside. This bell sound is heard inside us. It exists in each one of us. You go to the third eye center, you will hear the sound of the bell. That bell sound is so beautiful. It has got power. It's got a personality. It pulls you up. And that bell sound has been referred to as the word, as the word that is there in the beginning because that represents consciousness. That is the resonance of consciousness itself. It is not created externally. It is not made by any artificial means. And it is, does not follow any rules of race or nationality. It's in each human being. That sound when it, it is heard, it takes away all the distractions of external sounds. Here is a solution. We had three big obstacles to meditation. And by this methodology, by mantra, by dhyan, and by shabad, by listening to the sound, by these three methods, we are able to overcome all of them and proceed on our spiritual journey. So the masters give us the words which we can use in order to do the mantra, the repetition, the simran, the repetition of the words. The master's image is available for dhyan, for contemplation, to remove other images. And the inner sound is available within us, which at the time of initiation, the master connects so we can hear the sound more easily. The sound is there but our attention is not connected. When the master initiates, at that time he connects, so the sound becomes easily visible and we begin to hear it. And therefore, that sound becomes a constant method of removing the distraction of outer sounds. So these, to find a master or to be found by a master, to get the initiation from him, to get a mantra from him, to get his form for contemplation, makes it a perfect setting for the journey within to your spiritual destination. Without that, it's very difficult. People try it. People try to do it on their own. People tell me, we don't want an agent between ourselves and our God. I don't want an agent either. But I don't know where the railroad station is. I want to go and fly in a plane. I don't want an agent, but I let the pilot fly the plane. I want to go to a destination in a railroad train. I don't want an agent, but I let the conductor run the train. These are, these are people who are performing the role. They are not coming in the way. They are not agents for God. They are the ones that make God realization and self-realization possible. Otherwise, what are we doing? If we ignore the masters, 
and go it our own way we are dealing with nothing but our own mind and the mind is the only obstacle so we get trapped that the very enemy who sits in front of us is able to delude us into believing oh don't listen to anyone else listen to the mind and the mind will keep you in this trap forever that's how people have been trapped here forever to break this terrible ironical situation we are in we have to find a master and get this initiation and get the sound get the words of mantra and get the image all these three come as a package from a master makes spiritual progress easy now i don't know how many of you have found a master how many of you have got initiated how many of you have a mantra how many of you have a form to contemplate upon and how many of you have a sound that you have heard within which you can link yourself with but if you have use it in the later part of this workshop if you don't have it make a temporary arrangement i'll make a temporary arrangement for you today so that you can substitute something for the real thing the real thing like the coke ad, 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 uh, ad says is the coke but you can at betsy sometimes tastes equally good today if you don't have a real mantra you can coin a mantra for today's workshop but you will have to have a real uh, mantra in order to make a sustained progress on the spiritual path today if you don't have a master and you don't have his form physical form or the face to contemplate upon a living face that to contemplate upon you can have a temporary face to look upon and i'll tell you how if you don't have the sound uh, today you can hear practice sound that exists inside us for today the practice sound will do but we will overcome this obstacle temporarily even in today's workshop yes does it have to be a face yes it is but a person's face who whose consciousness is speaking from another world flows out through the eyes and the forehead of that face the eyes and the forehead that is why it has to be the face the only part that is relevant in a master's face is the eyes and the forehead you can ignore the rest that is where the spirit spirit of the higher consciousness speaks through and comes through even in this physical world can it be just simply an image of something that isn't a thing that's a mental maker the mind can make up any image that's the danger okay now how many of you have a mantra from a master good how many of you have a mantra may not be from a master but you use it thank you those who raise their hands please use this mantra in the next exercise repeat these words during the exercise repeat these words very slowly deliberately listening to what you are repeating let me tell you the secret of mantra the secret is not to speak like a parrot the secret is to listen like the soul if mantra is repeated in your head the mind should repeat it and you should listen to it you should not feel that you are repeating it you should feel that your mind is repeating it and you are listening to it sitting at the third eye center it works best now those of you who have not raised your hands and do not have a mantra please coin one mantra now and i'll tell you I'll give you a hint how to coin a good mantra there are many things happening in our body at different levels of consciousness such as the physical material contact with the world is taking place through this physical body the sensory experience of seeing touching tasting smelling is taking place because of our astral body the thinking and all mental activity is taking place because of our causal body the love and intuition is coming to us from our soul so if you want to coin a mantra temporarily coin it at the level beyond the mind that means it should be an expression of love and devotion make a sentence of love and devotion any one sentence you can make right now expressing your love and devotion for the lord it will be a good mantra for today just make it and express it with love and devotion it will work like a mantra for today take up a sound and focus on it without thinking of anything else fine but if you are listening to the sound and saying is this the right one should i make it louder should i make it less then that's not sound because these words we have to replace if the mind keeps on chatting along with the sound 
We have to stop that chatting of the mind. They have to be words. So pick up the words to take, tackle those words of the commentator called the mind. Okay, so make up your mantra. Now everybody is ready with a mantra? Okay. For contemplation, those who have a living master, please contemplate on the face of the living master, especially the eyes and the forehead. Let me tell you, these living masters come and live in our midst like ordinary human beings. They look like ordinary human beings. They are born like ordinary human beings. They get sick like ordinary human beings. They eat food like ordinary human beings. And they die like ordinary human beings. But let me tell you, they are not ordinary. In every way, they appear to be ordinary, but their impact upon us is extraordinary. What makes that? The reason why they are, their impact is so extraordinary, and yet they are so ordinary, is that behind their eyes, they have a consciousness that we are trying to get. They are conscious of all these other levels while they are talking to us on the physical plane. That is why they are different. But this portion of the power that comes through the eyes, in the head of a perfect living master, makes this a unique experience. And one of the secrets of this experience is, the eyes and the forehead of a master cannot be replicated or duplicated by the mind, even if it tries to. The mind can make up any face. The mind can make up any image it wants to by imagination. But the mind is incapable of making the eyes and the forehead of a perfect living master whose consciousness is speaking through this, through these eyes. It's a great, it's a great way to check out. So when you do this, you will find it's very difficult to copy a certain part of the face of your master. The rest of the face can be made out. The rest of the body can be made. The whole image can come up, but this will not come up. So for the purpose of dhyan, for those who do not have a perfect living master, you pick up again based upon the supremacy of love. Love is the highest experience we have in the three worlds. Therefore, using that, make the face of the beloved one you really love. Anybody, any human being, even of this world. It's the love that will transport you to using that image for good meditation. It's not the face that will do it. It's the love that will do it. If you have love for somebody, choose that face for your contemplation today. Okay, if this is taking care of two parts, third part, the sound, the distraction of the sound. Now there is the real bell sound that comes. It's a beautiful sound. It has got a gong effect, gong, gong, like a big bell. And it's coming from a distance. It appears to be approaching. If you try to move toward the sound, the sound stops. That's the experience we have in meditation. If you hear the sound and try to go toward the sound, the sound stops. Because we are mistakenly thinking sound is coming from that direction. The sound is coming from the center. In trying to go toward the sound, it stops because it was not from the side. So stay in the center, the sound keeps approaching us, rather than we have to go to the sound. Remember, the whole secret is to stay in the center. Before we hear this sound, we get other sounds, which are like chirping of birds, of crickets, and like, like a train going over a bridge and some thunder, some little sounds start coming in, which do not have the same pull. We call them practice sounds. So by staying on the center, you can hear some other smaller sounds coming up. Use those as practice sounds till you can get the real sound. That takes care of the third distraction. The practice sound is generally like a thunder, like a rolling of drums, like little drums rolling, like little bells ringing, like chirping of birds and crickets. These sounds will come first, and they do not have the pull. They are not the sounds that represent the resonance and the word and the nod and the shabad that we talk of. These are practice sounds coming from physical systems. But they are good for the removal of distraction of other smaller sounds from outside. So here I have given you the solutions to three problems that come in meditation. And use these three solutions as I guide you along in the next session where use them one by one. Don't try to use all three at once. Use the mantra first. In fact, on the spiritual discipline, you could be on the course for mantra for months before you are ready for the next one. 
Because unless the mantra becomes virtually a part of your habit, and the mantra is repeated by the mind by habit, you don't have to do it. You have not completed your course of mantra. So mantra should be a habitual thing that you just tune in and start listening to it. That takes time. But if you get into that, then you are in a position to move to the next step. Key is this is not a mechanical thing. We are talking of the soul, the spirit. The soul of a human being, what is that soul? That consciousness. Supposing there was nothing left to be conscious of, what would it be filled with? It will be filled with love and intuition and joy. That's the real nature of the soul. It will not be filled with thoughts and logic and deductions, which is the nature of the mind. The mind can reason. The mind can sense. The mind can come to conclusions. The mind can think. It cannot love. Only the soul can love. Therefore, our inner core, our real self, is the one that has the power to love and receives the love. Even in this physical plane, when we have that experience of love, it is not the mind having it. It's the soul having it. The mind very often destroys it. We get the love and the mind says, are you sure? And kills the love that we are experiencing. So mind does not create love, the soul does it. Therefore, in this meditational position, when we are in the contemplative mode or we are in the other modes for getting real progress, we should be in an attitude of love and devotion. Love and devotion is the key to success in meditation. In fact, my master, the great master, used to say that this meditation is not what takes you in. This meditation is like a thermometer. You know thermometer, which takes the measures the temperature when you have got fever. He said the thermometer never gives fever to anybody. If you got fever, the thermometer can tell you how much fever you have. You don't put the thermometer to get fever. Similarly, the meditation is like a thermometer. It does not give you spiritual progress. It measures your spiritual progress. It measures how far you've gone on the spiritual progress. What gives you spiritual progress is your love and devotion. So that is close to your soul and close to your creator. So love and devotion, without love and devotion to do any meditation is like doing a mechanical exercise with no results spiritually. Just like they did with yoga. Yoga was supposed to be one with love and devotion. Action without regard for reward. Skill, skillful action without reward. Yoga, karma, sakaushalam. As Krishna told Arjun in the battlefield, that skillful action without reward, that is what will be yoga, the union with the truth, the union with God. Yoga is union. But you cannot have this union if you go on mechanically doing something. If you could mechanically repeat things, well, maybe the parrots would have got it by now. Some other animals would have got it who do it repeatedly. One of the mystics, he warns, he says, human beings, seekers of God, don't treat this as a mechanical thing. All the animal kingdom will get away with the truth if you think it's only a mechanical thing. There are birds chirping and doing Simran all the time, the dogs barking. We say you remain awake at night, do meditation, the dogs are awake, they'll get it. He warns us. But this is a path for the human being with love and devotion so that we touch the innermost key of our being, which is the soul. And that is only touched with love and devotion and not with reasoning, thinking, speaking, or having all these superficial activities around us. So when you have this exercise and you go into contemplation, it should be done with love and devotion. Okay, let's start. Let's begin with the use of the mantra. Close your eyes, establish yourself in your beautiful chair behind the eyes in the third eye center. Make sure you are there. Make sure you are not hovering around anywhere in space. That you are really inside your body, behind the eyes. That you are conscious of the body around you, of the head around you. That you are conscious that you are there. And having seated yourself there, slowly, deliberately start repeating the mantra. And stay in the center. Two, three, four. Five, open your eyes, open your eyes, look this way, come back. Any one of you had a good time? Please raise your hands if you enjoyed the session. Good, good, that's good percentage, very good. Anybody saw the light? Good, that's a low percentage. 
others have to work hard. Anybody heard the sound? Inner sound. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody had any difficulties doing this exercise? Yes, let's start from here. I kept getting distracted constantly. Uh, I couldn't see the master's face and I, I'm, I don't visualize well. I can feel his presence, but I can't see his face. And I kept trying to see his face, but then I go, go back to the first step and, and just do the mantra. And I try to see his face and I drift and then I go back to the first step. I was doing that kind of thing. Okay. You'd have to ask for more grace. We'll talk about grace later. Okay, anybody else had a question or a comment? Yes. That's so helpful moving from mantra to, to trying to see the face to trying to hear. Not so much trying to hear, but I found that so helpful. Good. With the various kinds of distractions. That sort of good. So you found a way of using different things for different distractions. Yeah, right. Very good. Anybody else? To share anything or ask any question? Yes. I couldn't uh, hear any sound. No sound. It'll come by itself. You don't have to try. Sound is one thing you don't try to hear. Mm, that's why I kind of figured I was... If you try, you won't hear it. Okay. Maybe you tried. I tried. <laughs> You're right. You got it. If you try, that mental effort becomes a block. Yeah. I try to stay focused on the image, but then I keep getting these beautiful colors, and so then I want to follow the colors. And so what do you stay with? I was saying all the time, don't follow the colors. I know, but I'm so tempted. <laughs> no, you, you have to pull back. Wherever you're located, when the colors come, the tendency is to be closer to the colors. That's the, that's the moment to pull back. And then you get centered again. Yes. When I was in the middle, and I know I was in the yeah. side, and yet it was just like, like a variety of eyes. They are the eyes of people that you have known in the past, either in this life or in a still more remote past life. They are real eyes. Yes. If I hear the sound, it's so faint. Just... Well, uh, you are uh, close to the center when you move right into the center, a little front of the center. You should push back. You move back, the sound will come louder. And these blobs of colors and form that are moving, you should not, they take you a little forward of your center. Ignore them. Totally ignore them. Don't try to look if that's the light. You just concentrate on being at the center and behind. And then this will turn into light. That emptiness is an intermediate stage. Even in the emptiness, stay in the center. You'll go through the emptiness and other views will come up. Other sounds will come up then. We are all at different stages. So you have to do what is required at that stage. We all pass through a state of emptiness. Before these flickering lights and little lights that come and these little streaks of light that come from the side and stars that we see in a dark thing, the stars seem to shine. All those are temporary. After that, we get into a state of darkness. There is nothing. And we are at peace. No, nothing is happening. And we move through it and then the big light comes and the big sound comes. So you should stay in the center. Now when I say stay in the center, I am conducting a beginner's course. I want to tell you this. When I stay, say stay in the center of your head, I am, I am uh, giving this instruction as a beginner's course. Soon after that you will find that you are not even conscious of the body. Then how can you be in the center of the head? You are flying free. You are floating in space. Once that happens, then you cannot come back again to the body in order to experience where the head is. In such a case, fly freely and stay in the center of the space where you are flying. Stay in the center of your own consciousness where you are flying. Don't put your thoughts on what you are seeing around you in the flying. Stay flying, but be in the center where you are flying from. And that takes you further on the progress. But the body, you become unconscious of it. So I'm mentioning this because some of you have crossed that stage and may pull yourself back into a lower stage just to keep conformity with what I'm saying. But I'm giving you a beginner's course. Later on, we'll have a separate course for those who are more advanced 
that are already flying in the space because this head contains more space than the entire universe outside. Billions of galaxies can fit into this little space we call our head. You just have to go in and see how much space opens up. Everything is inside here. Everything is inside. You can fly all over without problem. But that stage comes when you have lifted yourself above the state when you are conscious of your body. You have to be unconscious of your body in order to be able to fly like that. This unconsciousness of the body is called dying while living. Dying while living is very important to go to the next step. How does one die? One dies by consciousness being withdrawn from the extremities of this body into the torso, into the face, into the brain. A person can be speaking, but he is no longer aware of his arms. You go to the hospitals and see people dying. They are, they are even speaking to us, but you can, they can't tell where their hands and feet are anymore. Gradually, so they die gradually in this body till the brain dies last. And when that dies, they are gone. They don't see anything, it's finished. It becomes a heap of ash. So that process of dying, where you lose the awareness of your extremities and eventually your whole body, is the same process we employ in meditation. In meditation, when we put our attention on the center, we are really withdrawing our attention from the extremities of the body. And after a while, we feel we don't know where the hands and feet are. And we are still conscious of ourselves. Gradually, as the attention is drawn behind the eyes, we do not know where our body is. And we are flying free. At that time, we don't have to run back to the body because we are making progress. When I pull you back by counting five, you will come back here. Don't worry about it. You won't fly away somewhere else. You are still in the body, but unconscious of the body. When you are unconscious of the body, but conscious of yourself, you know who you are. How can you know who you are if you are not the body? If this physical body is not you, but a cover upon you, how can you know who you are? The best way is take the body away and see who you are. Well, either you die, in which case the body goes away and you'll find out who you are. Or if you want to find out earlier than that, die while living. That means withdraw your attention behind the eyes, become unconscious of the body in the same way and see who you are. You find you have another body. You have another body which is very similar. You fly, you move, you do things almost the same way in a lightweight body. So that body also dies. <clears throat> if you want to know who you really are in that body, withdraw your attention in that body. Again to the same eye center of that body. When you withdraw your attention to the center of that body, that body dies. That means you become unaware of it. And you find you are still there. In a formless state, you have no form like this. But that is still the same you, the same self that gives you an idea that you are somebody else. It's like a causal form. It's a form that causes the forms to come. It's formless. But yet it is you. It has all your thoughts. All the thinking machine is still there. Your love and devotion is still there. Your meditation is still there. But you have dropped the body, physical body. You have dropped the senses. You don't need the senses. You find that your power of conceiving things includes all senses. That your power to be mentally absorbing things includes all senses that you had dropped. It's a strange feeling, but that's you. If you want to know, if you drop that causal self, your mind also, and who you really are, concentrate on the center of that body, the causal body. Withdraw your attention to the center, the conscious part of that body, and you will be dropping the thoughts also. There will be no thoughts left around you. And that happens, you will find you are still there. And you are full of love and devotion overflowing. This bliss that we call is really love overflowing in us. That love overflowing for the whole thing. How it is set up. For the consciousness itself. And that overflow, that pure spiritual love that is flowing is yourself. In fact, that's the first time you have seen yourself in your own stark nakedness. You've been wearing these clothes forever. The mind was the first set of clothes you wore. Over that you wore the clothes of the astral and sensory systems. Over that you're wearing these clothes, gross clothes of the physical body. You've never seen yourself. Drop, drop these three covers, you find who you are. And once you find who you are, it's such a great experience. Because then you know what your reality is, what your essence is, what your truth is, what your totality is. And you move towards your totality. 
removing the last subtle cover, which is so subtle, it has not even been described as a cover. If you have found your soul, found your spirit, what cover can there be? There's a very subtle cover called the cover of individuation. You are still practicing in that consciousness a role called individuation. You become an individual soul, which is a role, which is an illusion. When you drop that role, you become the total and discover the whole game was played up by the same single consciousness. That's the spiritual way to finding the truth. And you go degree by degree, gradually, and discover the whole thing. And if you find the master who has done this, he can guide you at every stage. The masters don't come to, into our life in a physical form and tell us what to do and then go away. They establish themselves in their inner form inside us. So we have a constant companionship. The perfect living master never leaves us at any one of these stages, but is constantly with us and we do this journey together. That's the beauty of this companionship and this friendship with the perfect living master. The whole spiritual journey within is performed in a joint companionship and adventure going back home. So please remember that the instructions I give during this, these workshops are a beginner's course and there is a lot more ahead. And uh, if you start moving into that, don't come back for the instructions, but follow what will come as I've just explained to you now. Are you ready for the next session? Any, any more questions? Clear your doubts, clear your questions now so that you get the best benefit of this workshop. Okay, yes. And fear comes in. Is that the mind bringing you back? Yes, again? yes. Now you said you count to five and you bring us back, but if you're doing it alone, what brings you back? Your fear. Fear, who, who knows where I'll float away into? Right. That, that fear brings us back. If we haven't had these experiences before, <clears throat> we get fear. We are afraid, where will we go? What will happen? Don't be afraid, I'll count five. <laughs> but this fear is actually baseless, like most fears are. In this world, we are afraid of so many things. If we look back on the things that used to frighten us, we'll find most of them were baseless. Sometimes we are afraid of 10 things. This might happen, this might happen. What if this happened, this happened? None of those ever happen. But they all kill us with their fear. Why be afraid 10 times over when none of those are going to happen? Maybe one might happen. And so we are afraid 10 times over because we don't know. Fear is of the unknown. We don't know what is there. That's why we are afraid. If we get to know what is there, then we are not afraid. And if we do not, if we haven't seen that before and we are still afraid, then we build up our faith gradually. We build our faith upon the little experience we get that builds up our faith, then fear disappears. So gradually faith will take care of the fear. Till then, I am afraid fear does bring us back. But in this workshop, don't worry. Don't be afraid because I'll count five. <laughs> Wherever you are, you can go to any stage, I'll call you back by counting five. Five is a magic number for me. Why is it a magic number? Because it pulls you right from the fifth stage. The physical stage, which is here. The second astral or sensory stage, where you work with senses. The third causal stage, where you work with the mind. The fourth spiritual stage, where you work with the soul. And the fifth total stage, where there's only one consciousness. Wherever you are, from the fifth even, by counting five, I bring you to this workshop. Then you can go again if you like it. Okay, any other question or comment? Okay, let's start again. Go back into that beautiful space. Also, I might remind you, don't be tense. This is not a physical exercise. Don't put strain on your head or your eyes. No strain on your eyes or your head. I noticed some, some of you had some strain on your eyes. As if we have to strain to see something. Don't have to see anything. You have to relax behind the eyes. Just relax. Imagine you are there. Imagination is not straining. You put your hand up like this, please. Just put your hand up. Imagine you are sitting on your hand. Can you imagine? Any weight? Any strain? 
No. Like that, just, just like you imagine now, like that you imagine you are behind the eyes. No strain. You can lower your hand. The same way like you sat on the hand with no strain on yourself, pure imagination, in the same way, in pure imagination, sit behind the eyes, imagine you are there, don't put a strain on the head or the eyes. The natural tendency is to start looking with these eyes as if we have to turn these eyes in. Some of the yogis I find, they think we have to see the truth through these eyes and they have to turn their eyes inwards. I see them sitting in very awkward positions. I met them in the Himalayas. I've gone and seen those yogis. I must have seen more yogis than anyone else here. They try all kinds of things. But they are failing because they have no perfect living master. They're trying to do yoga based upon imperfect teachings. They think that this body is going to show everything. This body is a shell. This body dies. We are talking of something that will never die. Even imagination does not die, but the body dies. So we don't have to turn these eyes backwards or try to put strain on these eyes to see what's going on. Forget about seeing what's going on. Just be there. Relax behind the eyes. Be there. I'm telling you my life's experience that I made these mistakes myself. I put too much strain thinking that this is a certain way of finding things. It's not a physical thing at all. You relax behind the eyes at that beautiful space where you sat your chair and had your nice feast in the morning. Sit there. Enjoy. Relax. It's beautiful. It's a spiritual place. It's a real temple. You are in a real temple where you can worship in the best possible way. I know no better place to worship than that place behind the eyes. So that's the place to relax and have a good time and think of the Lord and commune with the Lord. This is a great opportunity. And get the face of the beloved and experience that love and devotion in your heart while you're sitting there. But don't move from there. If things come in front of you, don't run after them. If images come, don't run after them. If colors float around you, did you, any one of you see colors floating around? Yes. So this is very common. Thank you. If you see these colors floating around, don't try to be drawn into the colors to see what they are. Stay back. In fact, stay back a step further back. So they can just float around and go. As if they're moving from one side and going. You'll see many of these things come and move. You'll see eyes. You'll see faces. You'll see faces of people coming up. Faces you've never seen before. But you actually have seen in past lives. You don't remember them. You don't know them. So they come up in this kind of meditation. And they come up and they float in front of you and go. Ignore them. They are coming because of your past attachments and past reactions. You haven't consciously remembered them. Let them come and go. They should not mess up your meditation. Stay in the center. And you will get all the goodies I'm talking about. So remember... Staying in the center till you are conscious of the body. When the body, you are becoming unconscious only of the head, stay in the center of the head. When you don't know where the head is, fly free in the sky, but remaining centered on where you are consciously flying, not on some cloud around you. Don't go anywhere. Stay centered on yourself. Clear? Close your eyes and begin. Two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Come back. You're back. Welcome. Did you have a better session this time? Or did you have fear? No fear. Good. Congratulations. Okay. Anybody has any questions on this session? First of all, how many of you enjoyed this one? This session. Good. Good. Percentage is going up. That's really good. Those who had any problems, can you ask any questions or get your difficulties resolved at this time? These sessions should be long enough not to be pulled back and then they give, get more and more of it. But this is an experimental workshop. So you have to continue these sessions when you go away. The workshop doesn't end here. It just begins here. Then you take this with you and you carry on this experimentation. And you do the meditation wherever you are. You get the full benefits. I realize that. I know you get a lot here. 
tell me, do you get more in these workshops or you get it even when you're back home? It's the same thing? I, I get them back home, but I, as the, when I'm away from you, it's like I can't get a hold of some of the things that I, you know, you teach and all. And uh, I, I miss it, you know. I'm not strong enough, I don't think yet. Is there anybody else who has this problem that gets gets uh, some results here, gets some goodies here, but not when you are away? You have this? Okay. Okay, with practice you'll be able to get more outside. Let me tell you one other thing, very important thing. This uh, whole thing we are doing is to go back home, where we belong. We are in a foreign country. We are in a foreign, we are in a foreign creation. We are, in a, we are too far removed from our own spiritual home. Our spiritual home is where our spirit feels comfortable and is at home. This is not that place. This physical world has too much of pain and suffering and too, it is messed up and messes us up and we mess it up further. I mean, strange kind of a messy place we are in. And that place is so beautiful, we feel much more comfortable there. So we'd like to go to our true home so this journey back to our true home takes us out of this mess that we are in now, which is not our true home. This is a home of unhappiness, and that's a home of happiness. So we want to move into that. We cannot do it if we merely wait to die, because fortunately or unfortunately, before dying, we create enough actions to come back again to reap the reward. We create our own karma. And by creating karma, we make sure we are here again and again. So like a big trap. It's a big prison house. We move from one cell to another, never getting out of the prison. So we have to do something before we die in order to get out of this mess. And that is why we have to find this way and do it while we are still here. We should not wait that when we die, something will happen. Because what will happen will be they will come back to pick up the rewards and the reactions to what we have done now. So to get out of this karma theory, to get out of this whole cycle of karma, we have to do something here. That is why all these practices we are doing are to take us out from here. We are very lucky that these people who are perfect living masters still walk about on this earth. They are very rare, extremely rare. There are a lot of yogis who can teach you how to do yoga and how to have access to your energy centers? These six centers below the eyes, up to the eyes, they are the six chakras that govern the energies that sustain the physical universe. It's very easy to go into those chakras and practice yoga of that kind. They do not take you out of life and birth and rebirth. They do not take you out of karma. They do not take you out of the cycle. So you may have interesting experiences, but you are still here. It's more difficult to find somebody who teaches you a path that does not let you go into these energy centers, but into awakened consciousness above the eyes. Very rare. But most of these people, the rare people whom you find who give you uh, uh, some instruction in awakening, in consciousness, in higher consciousness, they stop at the mental level. They think that the universal mind is everything. Because if you do not have a perfect living master coming from the region of love and therefore the region of true home, the universal mind looks like the absolute end. Nobody who has reached there has ever thought that there is anything beyond this, including the disciples of perfect living masters. When those who are following the path of the perfect living masters, they go there, they are certain this is the end of it. There can be nothing beyond. There is nothing that you can comprehend to be possible beyond that. Which is true because comprehension itself ends there. That's the end of the mental level. Only these perfect living masters know that the mind also has a life. Just like this body has a short life. The astral body has a little longer life in thousands of years. The mind has a life of a millions of years. It's still limited. There is still a birth and a death of the mind. However long it might be, it's not permanent. Therefore, even reaching the ultimate mental, universal mental region does not take you back home. But there are very few people who know about it. There are so few people in this world who will even distinguish for you the mind and the soul. 
Once they reach the universal mind, this is mind or soul, whatever, consciousness has reached its top. So they still, after a long time, you still come back into the cycle of birth and death. It's only extremely rare that there are a few people can be counted on your hands. On the fingers of your hand, you can count how many there are on this planet Earth. In different parts of the planet, they are there. They've always been there. Who are responding to the seekers who are seeking ultimate journey to their home, not seeking energy or seeking power or seeking some little refreshment on the way. Those who are seeking to liberate themselves, ultimate salvation, they don't want to be here anymore. Only those seekers, they run into these masters by coincidences. And then these masters teach the way to go beyond the mind into pure spiritual realms. Those perfect living masters, I call them only perfect living masters. Those perfect living masters are very rare. You cannot find them. I do not know any way by which I can recommend to you, go and find it. Only way I know is, seek for them in your heart. They'll find you. I am sure of that. I have tried this out. I have been following a perfect living master, doing his instruction and meditation for the last 58 years. I've seen him for the last 67 years, but I've been doing it for 58 years. That's a long enough time for me to tell you from my experience, if you seek inside, the perfect living master finds you. What more can I say? You don't have to worry whether you are in the east or the west. You don't have to worry which state you are in. You don't have to worry whether you're a man or woman or a child, a grown up. You don't have to worry what the color of the skin is, just be a seeker. If you are a seeker, a real seeker, you are bound to come across one of these perfect living masters. That's my experience. It's so difficult to know who is a perfect living master because they are more ordinary than ordinary people. They don't show any jugglery and come up and show extraordinary skills like the yogis do. They show ordinariness. They show such utter ordinariness that we get surprised. How can such utter ordinariness in a person have such extraordinary impact upon us. That's what makes us wonder. But as we go along, when we go within and see their real form, then we understand that they were not as ordinary as we thought they were. And they become true friends and take us right to our true home beyond the mind and we are free forever. Such people who are perfect living masters and walk upon this earth, their mission to come in this midst is to pick up their marked sheep, marked seekers. They don't come for their own sake. They have no other purpose in this life. They come, they take up the destiny of a particular human being, they take up the karma of any human being and then dwell in that body and then they work with the people and they go around in such a way that they can accomplish their task which is to pick up the marked souls that have to go back home through the intervention of that particular human being in this human life. Their real form is the word, the shabad, the sound. That's the real form. And that form is the same for all of them. They don't have, they are not different masters. There's only one master. That one master is the resonance of our own consciousness within. That becomes the master who looks like a human being outside. When we go within, we find the true nature of a master. When they come here, there's a difference between them and us. Both of us are ordinary, but they are in touch, in connection with something extraordinary. So they can speak with authority about certain things, which we cannot. Because they are in touch with the reality, they also have the power of intervention. And they are full of love and compassion. Thank God. They are so full of love and compassion that even little troubles that we have move compassion in them. And they go out of their way. Not only to say, all right, you do your destiny and we'll take you off from here. Do your meditation, we'll take you off. Occasionally, through their intervention, they give what is called grace. And we heard of grace of the Lord, grace of God, grace of a master, grace of a perfect one, grace of... What is this grace? This grace is, a, is an inter, intervention in our destiny. Our destiny is not qualified to have something. They put a little check on it. Okay, doesn't matter, you don't deserve it. Get it, take it. This kind of grace that we get, without this grace, we'll get nothing. Our karmic load is so heavy. We just have to look back on our own lives. If we look at our own account, 
we found we will find that we were not justified in having anything we can do without grace particularly in this age this age is so much an age of distractions in spite of the turn of the age and spirituality is around the corner but we need grace all the time we need grace because of our own actions our own history our own background and that is why we need this grace and intervention so how can we get grace of the lord what makes the lord we can get grace by trying to be pleasing to the lord that means if we implore the lord and don't implore other people he gives us grace if we are single minded in our devotion we get grace and sometimes he can give grace out of arbitrariness that we can't explain how but he does that occasionally and i see that happening i can't explain because he is free we are not free we are bound by our own destiny we are bound by our own karma we can't help ourselves he is free he is free to do what he likes when he wants to do it let us be close to him so we enjoy this arbitrariness also sometimes his arbitrary grace sometimes he gives us but then he is a great he is a great player he is a he is a great player he plays all kinds of games also first of all this creation itself is a big game the fact he could set it up in this way in this particular way makes him a remarkable creator of a play secondly within the play he comes himself and enjoys both as a producer director and a player and actor with the other actors i don't know how many of you have had a chance to read a book by chaucer called the canterbury tales old book in fact that book became famous because for the first time in english literature an author had written something about individuals and made characters this character characterization was not known earlier earlier they used to write novels and plays where a king was a king a king had a kingly disposition and a kingly character there were no individual characters but in this particular book chaucer geoffrey chaucer he decided to introduce characterization and he introduced characters who had very specific characters some of them look very common for example the lawyer the attorney he describes of those days the attorney he says a busier man than him there nos nos means never was a busier man than him there nos and yet he seemed busier than he was he looks like a, a modern day attorney too so similarly there was a, a wife of bath bath is a place in england <coughs> wife of bath husbands at church door she had five without an other company that is besides other company but of that i need not talk of now that means is not appropriate for me to talk now this kind of characterization had not come into english literature earlier so he became famous but why i am bringing him into this picture today is not because of his characterization but the fact that in that book called the canterbury tales he writes about a group of pilgrims going to canterbury canterbury is the place of pilgrimage where on a particular day they all go so they were on a holiday to canterbury and all going together walking along there were no trains or planes so as they were walking along they said how do we pass the time it will take a month to reach canterbury so they decided to tell each other stories or sing poems or do something sing songs so they were entertaining each other with all these poems and skits and songs and lovely verses some of them came out with all these characters then chaucer says the author of all this book he says i was also there so he becomes a character in the middle in the middle they say chaucer you are such a great poet great writer you write all the books why don't you tell us a poem and he says i don't know poems the man who written all the poems as a character says i know nothing <clears throat> they insist on it when they insist on it he comes out with the worst doggerel rhyme in the whole book and not that he didn't know it all the other characters attack him oh we expected better from you we didn't know that you will do so bad the question has been raised why did chaucer who was the author of the book he could have given any role to himself why did he put himself as a character in the book and then get crucified by his own characters you see the see the parable the see the simile why did christ the son of god with the power of god with the knowledge of god come into his own creation and be crucified by his own creation 
looks like it's the same situation. There must be a single answer to answer both these questions. Why did the Son of God come and be crucified by his own creation? Why did Chaucer, the author of the book, put on a role to himself that he is crucified by his own character that he himself makes? The answer is very simple. The answer is that the character who is being crucified is not Chaucer, the author. Chaucer, the author, is all the characters. Christ, Jesus, the one who is crucified, is not Jesus. He's a character. The Jesus that saved all bark sheep was still all of them who were saved. This totality people miss out. It's a great spiritual message. It's a message showing that a perfect, enlightened person does not have to take any particular part to show his enlightenment. He can take the worst part and bring enlightenment out of it. And that has happened with all perfect living masters, you will see. When they come here, they have allowed themselves to be crucified. They have allowed themselves to be attacked because it made no difference to them. They were not that individual character. They were just representing that point of view in that show through which they could do their work and take the people that they had to take back home. So that is why you'll find that these perfect living masters, when they come in our midst, we, we, we play with them. They play with us. There's a big game to play. They come and say, we are nothing. And we start believing they are nothing. And then something happens to us. Say, no, no, you are playing a game. You are something. Say, oh, what makes you think so? Okay, let's move on. Ultimately, we find that the whole game has been set up by those people. They are one with the creator. They have got that consciousness where at all times they are in touch. Therefore, they can afford to play any game and not be hurt by it. So This is a great game going on. Because of this game, we have to be careful if we run into these people who are enlightened. Don't expect that they will tell you they are enlightened. They don't. Don't expect that they will tell you they are masters. They don't. The more perfect they are, the less they tell you. They don't want to tell you, they want you to know. Because if they tell you, the danger is you'll accept what they told you. You'll be blind believers, which you have been even in the past. That's what they want to pull us out of. People told us something and we believed it blindly and did nothing to it. If they come and tell us the same way, we'll believe it and do nothing. So they don't tell us. They say, go in and find out. See what you see. Discover for yourself. They put us on the spiritual path. They make us work our way back and gradually we find out who they are. Stage by stage we discover who they are. So in this kind of a game, relationship with these people, it's very interesting. It is so playful and so joyful because then you can get grace but just by this game playing with these people. It becomes human. They bring the drama of the spiritual relationship to the human level. Because they know in this world, we human beings cannot love anything, anybody except a human being. They know that. This feeling of love that we have is only possible. This feeling is only possible with another human being. It's not possible with dogs and cats. You might say, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my house, I love my mansion, I love my this. Those are all attachments. Attachments are possible with anything. Love is only possible with a human being. The difference between the two is, in attachment, the I, the ego, comes first. I love my cat. Have that experience. Take a cat in your lap and see how you love the cat. I love my cat. It's only love in which you forget the I and only know the beloved. It's only love that can make you identify with the beloved, that you forget who you are, you forget your ego. And you only know the beloved. In fact, the perfect living masters tell us, there is no solution for ego except love. For human ego, this I-ness that is holding us down, there is no solution. It's only the experience of love that puts the ego in the back bench. Everything else that we do in this world puts the ego in front. I am going to achieve this. I am going to do Hatha Yoga. I am going to do Yoga. I am going to do meditation for so many hours. I am going to succeed. I know how to reach heaven. I, I, I. The eye is so strong, it never goes and it stops us from getting anything. It's only the experience of love. Somebody gives you love, you forget 
You don't know what to do. I is gone. The beloved is there. You can't get rid of the face of the beloved. That experience comes only by love. And therefore, that is the art of these perfect living masters. They don't work through their reasoning and through their minds. They work through their love. Ultimately, they take us on their path through love, nothing else. They use other methods because we want those methods. They use language because we want to learn in language. They use words because we are interested only in understanding in words. They use reason and logic because we want it to be sensible what they are saying. It's our requirement they are meeting. It's not their requirement. They need nothing else to take us back home except love. And that's what they ultimately use and take us back home. The rest is only a preface for our sake because we need it. They don't need it. Nor does the spiritual path need it. Therefore, remember, this is that love that comes from that level is not put down in the words that we use in these instructions at all. These instructions are the spoken word. And that power which they represent, which they personify, is the unspoken word. The unspoken word, the unwritten language, that is the language through which they take us home. We, we don't even know by the time we are in love with the masters. We don't even know how they're taking us on the path. We don't even know because of that love, intense love, they give the grace and intervention at every step. And our whole life is changed. So this is the path of love and devotion. It's not a path of reason and trying to understand better or using more words or reading more books or learning more vocabulary. This is not that path. If somebody wants to be a learned person, there are a lot of books. If books could take us back home, why are we having so many more books? We already got millions of them in every language in the world, the books on spirituality. The revelations are there in Sanskrit, in English, in Hebrew, in, in Old Germanic, in every possible language you'll see them. If books could take us home, we are trying to get more books. Books are only adding the burden. We carry those heavy books. Now we can carry them on discs, it's become light. But they're still the same books. <coughs> These books won't take us home. What will take us home is what the books say, and we act upon them. The books are saying the same thing. The truth is within you, go within. We don't go within, we read one more book on it. We say, why, that was a great book I read. It was a wonderful book. I'm going to read it again. All right, read it again. I found another one, even better. I'm going to read both the books. Ultimately, we read hundreds of books, and we are still where we were. It's almost like, saying that I want to enjoy a plane ride from here. I want to go to Los Angeles from Boston in a plane, and I found a time schedule of the airline that flies there. American Airlines flies straight to Los Angeles. I got their time schedule. I read it. So many flights. They serve snacks on the way. They serve meals. There are so many lovely non-stop flights. I have found all them. I'm going to read it all over again. So you read the whole time schedule all over again. You can read it a hundred times. You have not gone anywhere except in Boston. You are still there. But that's what we think we can do. Spiritual work, spiritual path we can do by reading books. The books are no more than time schedules. They are no more than guidebooks. You take a guidebook on Hawaii. Beautiful. They give you pictures. Lovely beaches there. Lovely pretty people there. Dancing and Tahitian songs and whatnot. Those who have been to Hawaii know. Very attractive places. They put them in a book. And we read and gloat over it. You can read that guidebook hundreds of times over. You don't reach Hawaii. How come that we know these simple truths? And about spiritual books, we think the more we read, we are reaching somewhere. We don't reach anywhere. We just get into vain ideas, into more ego. I have read more books than you have. You heard the story of King Janak. King Janak uh, was, uh, he was an Indian ruler. The story is that he was a great spiritual seeker and ultimately became a master. King Janak wanted to find real knowledge, true knowledge. And he did not know where to find it. So he asked his ministers and his secretaries, can you get me somebody who can give me real knowledge, the truth? They said, your majesty, you are living in a country which is full of learned enlightened people. And these learned enlightened people like good feasts. All you have to do is to hold a big feast, put a lot of good food on the tables and invite all of them. And when they come here, you can ask them, they'll give you real knowledge. So he organized a big feast. 
and all the holy men came some covered with ash some wearing orange robes some wearing white robes some swamis with all kinds of dresses hairstyle some big hair some small hair some clean shaven every kind of swami and yogi was present there by the thousands they came because food was good so they all assembled and they ate good food and the king disguised himself he disguised himself incognito like an ordinary person he like an ordinary person who is also visiting them he disguised and walked in their midst in the evening and in the night he walked and listened to them what they were saying he was shocked they were fighting with each other who had read more books they were fighting on the interpretation this word means this the other man said no i know it this doesn't mean this same book same veda and they are misinterpreting and they are fighting ultimately they came to blows with each other and the king said are these enlightened people they have read so many books and they have not lost their anger yet they have not even controlled their anger what kind of realization is this he got very disappointed he found they were learned people they had remembered certain books scriptures by heart but they had no realization they were not transformed people so he was very disappointed and came back to his palace crying i am sorry this these people had given me no knowledge so he called his ministers and he called his secretaries and he said i had a very disappointing experience i didn't get any real knowledge so the ministers and secretaries said well king what could you expect it was a one day feast all the people didn't come you should have a seven day feast this was not enough time to find the truth so have a seven day feast so the king organized a bigger feast he pitched up more tents and more camps and called all the people in and sent messengers all over the country so more people should come and thousands more came and better food was prepared and laid all over the tables so the, all these yogis and swamis and different colored robes and young and old all kinds of people came and they fed themselves and brought their big books with them and they recited some of them recited verbatim some recited from books that were not there some did acrobatics in the name of yoga some put their head down and their feet up some walked with their head all kinds of yoga tricks they did and the king again disguised himself and he went all over and he could not find anybody who could give him the truth he was very disappointed that all this time we believe that these people who have read so many books and those who have done so much yoga must be realized they haven't even controlled their elementary passions their lust is no different their anger is no different their greed is no different their attachments are no different their haughtiness their ego is no different how are these people enlightened he was shocked that learning did not help these people at all these books did not help them thoroughly disappointed he came back to his palace and told his secretaries and ministers i have had a very sad experience with these people the ministers and secretaries said well king if you wanted that kind of enlightenment these people can't give you the the person who can give you is a perfect living master and he is sitting on the bank of a river and his name is ashtabakkar which means the eight curves because he is a hunchback there are eight curves on his back he doesn't look very handsome and so he doesn't come out he just lives on that cave he will not come to your feast if you want to invite him go to him and invite the king said why didn't you tell me first i was wasting my time with all these learned people i want to find a perfect living master so he went to ashtabakkar's cave on the on the river and he met the master sitting there with just a handful of disciples around him and the ashtabakkar saw the king come in he said welcome king what brings you here he said i have come to invite you to give me true knowledge i have tried with all these people who read so many books they could not give me anything i want you to give me true knowledge ashtabakkar said i am very pleased you have come and made this request certainly i will come at uh, if fixed a date and he said on that date i will come to your palace and give you true knowledge so on the appointed day the king arranged a big reception for him filled up a hall with all his relatives nobles all the other neighbor neighborly kingdoms people came the princess princesses everybody came they filled up the hall with all royalty and nobility and he put up a stage a dais on which he set up two chairs one for the king himself and one for the master ashtabakkar at the appointed time ashtabakkar came accompanied by about five or six of his disciples and they took off their shoes at the entrance as was the custom there and they walked up 
and the king welcomed Ashtabakar and put him on the dais and made him sit on the chair. Ashtabakar, when he was walking through the aisle to the chair, the people saw his hunchback, how deformed he was, and they began to laugh and giggle. What has happened to our king? In pursuit of spiritual truths, he's calling this hunchback to come and give him a knowledge. What can this kind of man give him a knowledge? He should have called some learned man. So they were murmuring and they were making fun, mocking at this master who had come. So when the master sat down, he asked the king, he says, King, what is the price of leather today? The king was sur surprised. He said, Master, I called you here to give me true knowledge. I did not know you are going to ask me about the price of leather. He said, but I was looking at these merchants, these leather merchants, that maybe they have come here to find the price of leather. The king said, they are not leather merchants. They are royalty, nobility. They are my relatives and other uh, royal people from other kingdoms. The master said, oh, but they looked at my body like they were more interested in my skin than in me. So I thought maybe they are leather merchants. So then there was a hush. Everybody kept quiet. That this uh, master has a sense of humor also. So they kept quiet to listen to him. And then he said, King Janak, what kind of knowledge do you want? King Janak said, I want instant knowledge, which makes me believe he was an American in his past life. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't have asked for that. I want instant knowledge. Ashtabakar said, even an instant has some time. How do you define an instant? The king said, I go on my horseback in the morning. From the time I put my foot into the stirrup and jump on the saddle is one instant. If you can give me knowledge in that instant, I'll think you've given me the true knowledge. Ashtabakar said, oh, for that kind of knowledge, you have to pay a price. The king said, I'm willing to pay any price. All my treasures are open. You can take any price you want and give me this knowledge. The king offered everything he had. Ashtabakar, the master said, I only want three things. You give me three things, I'll give you instant knowledge. He said, yes, you can take 10 things. What are those three things you want? He said, I want your body. I want your mind and all. I want your wealth. Give me these three. I'll give you instant knowledge. That was a strange price tag. But the king was such a great seeker. He agreed to the price tag. He said, I'll pay you this price. This body of mine is at your disposal. All my wealth, all my palaces and my treasures are yours. And my mind is also yours. Give me instant knowledge. The master said, are you sure you've given me this price? He said, yes, to the best of my ability, I've handed over these three things to you. The master said, is this body of yours mine now to do what I like? He said, yes. All right, take this body up from this chair and walk down the aisle and sit on those shoes that I left at the doorstep. So the king said, this is a strange kind of instruction to get true knowledge. But he got up and he walked towards his shoes. As he walked, all the gathering that had become quiet after that story of the leather, they began to giggle again. This is a strange kind of way of getting true knowledge. He's telling the king to sit on the shoes. How can he get knowledge out of that? So they began to mock again. The king thought to himself, after all, these people are only royalty. They are not spiritual people. They don't know what I'm looking for. They are only thinking of my palaces and my treasures. And that is why they are thinking I'm doing a foolish thing. This thought came to the king. When this thought was coming into his head, the master shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of those palaces and treasures. They are no longer yours. And the king said, oh my God, I forgot I had given them up to him as part of the price. And why am I thinking of them? When he said this, the master shouted, King, you have no business to think what you should think. You have given your mind to me also. He said, oh, I, oh God, I can't even think. And he put his head like this. And he had instant knowledge at that moment. The light shone instantly when he found he had nothing. The mind was not even his. And before he could sit on the shoes, the master said, King Janak, come back. You don't have to sit on the shoes anymore. So he walked back. He said, take this chair. Now tell me, did you get instant knowledge? He said, yes, sir, I did. Do you have any questions? No questions. Any doubts? No doubts. Was it given to you within the time you specified? 
He said, Master, you gave it to me faster than an instant. So this King Janak story shows that it is not, it was not what he thought was learning. It is not the books. It was a sudden realization that came when he found these three things that hold us here were no longer his. After that, the master told King Janak, King Janak, I don't need your wealth. And I don't need your body. And I don't need your mind. I have plenty of it myself. Take all these back. But I don't want to slow down your spiritual progress. You got a sampling of it today. Now you have to do meditation from now onwards. But in order to practice good meditation, remember that you have given away this body and your wealth and your mind to Ashtabhaka. Use them as if they are still mine, but you are only using them and you will have no trouble in your meditation. That was a great lesson. That while we have everything here, if we treat all these things as if they belong to the Lord, given to us for use, we will have very smooth sailing on our spiritual path. But when we try to make these things our own, we run into difficulties. So the easiest way, as the question was asked earlier, how do we deal with this problem of making things our own? Don't try that. You consider all these things are belonging to the Lord. He's given them to us for use. Use them carefully. It belongs to somebody else. Use your wealth carefully. It belongs to somebody else. Use your body carefully. It belongs to somebody else. Use your mind carefully. It belongs to somebody else. And your spiritual practices will go much more smoothly than they have gone in the past. So I, I just took this little time to intervene and give you a little story. Do you like the story yeah. of King Janak? Any questions on the story? Yes. If the, if the uh, King Janak story, King Janak in the end gives these three things back, or at least, um, the master gives these things back to King Janak, and it was King Janak's responsibility to handle these three, these things the best he knew how. Right. Remembering, of course, they belong to his master. Right. Okay. When you think that everything belongs to the Lord, you are far more careful. You are more reckless with your own things. You are far more careful with things that belong to somebody else. Certainly if they belong to somebody on whom your whole life depends, certainly you are far more careful if they belong to your beloved. So when these things are taken to belong to your beloved, you are far more careful, your whole lifestyle changes. The spiritual path is not merely a method of sitting in quiet, closing your eyes and finding the truth. The spiritual path is a whole transformation of our lifestyle. The way we live, the way we eat, drink, the way we think, how we do all the things in life, that's part of the spiritual path. Meditation is not merely sitting quietly and listening to the repetition of the words or the mantra inside the head. Meditation is doing the mantra in every part of life. Walking, talking, cooking, driving. The mantra should be part of our life. Meditation is not confined to a particular time, it's confined to the whole of life. So the whole of life should become a meditation in order to get the benefits that we speak of that these perfect living masters have. These perfect living masters do not come here to make us better people. They come here to make us like themselves. Perfect living masters come here and when they make us what they want to make us, we become perfect living masters like them. There is a stone called the philosopher's stone that turns iron into gold. Paras. The paras converts iron into gold. These masters are not like the ordinary paras, not like the ordinary philosopher's stone that converts iron into gold. They are such philosophers, such paras, they convert the iron into the philosopher's stone. So they make their disciples into themselves not something better but different from them. Therefore, their love is so immense. They identify, they want you to be just like them. They want to give you everything they have. They come here to give, not to take. They are not the ones who call you on the telephone and says, send $20, we'll pray for you. They don't charge anything for their fee. They do their work in their destiny. They set up a destiny for themselves where they have a job to do like us. They do their job, they work, they earn their living, and then they give us 
out of their earnings as well as out of their time. All these perfect living masters, look at their life. They have done some other work with their hands to earn their living. And then they have shared their knowledge with us. They have not charged for this knowledge. They are not beggars, they are givers. But we have thousands of beggars going in the name of masters. How can they be masters if they are beggars from us? If they survive on what we give them, what will they give us? They have nothing. They make a business out of it. But these rare, perfect living masters who come and give so much freely. Of course, the best thing they give us is their love. There's nothing like it. The best thing they give us is their constant, eternal friendship. And I want to tell you, I've gone around the world and I don't find those kind of true friends anywhere. We say friendship is very important and we should have a true friend. I believe that. Each one of us must have for our own emotional stability, for our own mental sanity, we must have a friend to talk to. But we have no real friend in this world. Somebody looks like a real friend. After a while, the same friend becomes somebody and we say, why, I never expected that from him. I never expected that from her. It's happening all the time. Over a period of time, you discover there is no real friend in this world. They're temporary friendships. Nobody goes with us. When we die, all these people are around. Nobody's helping us. Nobody's going with us. At that moment, we discover that there was no real friendship, no real relationship in this world, except with the master who goes with us within and even after death. If there's real friendship, that's only with a perfect living master. How lucky we are that we have this information. I sometimes feel this is the great, we talk of the great shift of the spiritual access into the West, the great resurgence of the age of Aquarius and the age of enlightenment and the age of discovery. All this is possible because these people are around and walking. Otherwise, there's no age. There's no possibility of any age coming except the Iron Age continuing. There is nothing happening. People's greed is as strong. People's anger is as strong. People's lust is as strong, getting worse all the time. All the negativity in people is getting strong. Where will you get the age of Aquarius? Where will the spiritual resurgence come? It's only possible because amongst this gross stuff, there are enlightened people, the perfect living masters still walking about who can purify us and pick us up. These masters come down to our level. If they float above, above us, we won't pick them up. If they are perfect human beings, we will avoid them. I can tell you this. We'll be too shy, too afraid, too intimidated to go near perfect people. Sometimes we see the perfect side, we are afraid of approaching them. We see their human side, we can approach them. I have sometimes given an example. If a master were to come and he showed his power that he is not like us, and he walked in this hall, entering from there, three feet above the ground, in the air to show that he is not ordinary. He doesn't walk on the ground, he walks on the air. And he walked in and stood up in the air here. How would you react? You would either be amazed. I would first of all see if there's any wiring or something. <laughs> if there's something that he's using as a trick. First thought. Second thought will be this frightening. What kind of power does he have? I'd be afraid. I'd be horrified. I would even admire. I would not love that person. Love is not evoked by this at all. You would never have the feeling of love and devotion for a person who is walking up in air. If by chance he trips and falls down, so many of us will run and catch him and say, please, are you hurt? And for the first time, we'll have a feeling of love for that man. Do you understand? You have to be human to have the experience of love. You have to be utterly human. You have to have the human strengths and weaknesses. You have to have the human composition in order to feel that this is love that can grow here, that we can feel comfortable with that love. So these masters who don't need any of this stuff, they don't need this dross and gross stuff that we are going through, but they come to our level. They become like us. They do things that we do in order that we can have an experience of love for no other reason. And when we have experience of love, from that point onwards, they take us up gradually, stage by stage, to a realization that they were really somewhere else all the time. So this particular nature, this particular game of these perfect living masters, to come to our level, to drop down to the very lowest level where we are, and pick us up from there and take us up, is the remarkable 
and is not available in any of the yogis and swamis who have got something in enlightenment, but they cannot have the experience of love for ordinary people like us. So I am really very happy to tell you that there are perfect living masters on this earth planet and there will be more. According to the prediction made by my master, the great master, there will be many more in this part of the world. They'll be born in this part of the world. You don't have to wait for them to come from the east. They'll be, they'll be born here, grow here. I had a hard time. I came through immigration. Many spiritual people are now coming without immigration by rebirth. They die in India and they come back and born in America. What can we do? They have no problem with the customs or immigration. <laughs> we had to go through green cards and citizenship and whatnot. But the, but the spiritual axis is shifting. And this is a great scene. This where we are is a great scene for spiritual activity and for marked sheep being picked up by perfect living masters. So I congratulate all of you. Okay, let's go into the session. I diverted too much. Close your eyes. At the third eye center, reflect upon all that has happened today in this workshop. And with love and devotion, as the prime, prime motivator, love and devotion for the master, as the prime driving force, set behind the eyes. Use your mantra. Use your contemplation. Do not try to hear anything. If the sound comes, listen to it. If it disappears, go back to mantra. Do not try to get it. If it comes by itself, listen to it. Listen as long as it is there but stay in the center behind the eyes. Two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Was this a good session? I know for some people you had a good time. Any questions? This is called the practice of dying while living. Once upon a time, there was a merchant in India who did export and import business. That means he used to take some silks and things like that and sell them in Africa and brought cashew nuts and other products of Africa back into India and sold them there. During his trips into Africa, he used to pass through a jungle, a forest, in which there were very beautiful parrots, beautiful parakeets, lovely birds. He liked them so much that he decided to bring one of them back home to India with him. So he bought a cage and went into the forest, caught hold of one of the birds, put into the cage and brought it back to India. After a year, the merchant was going back to the African forest for his business. So he told the parrot in the cage, I am going back to Africa to your homeland and I'll meet your folks back there. Do you have any message to send to them? And the parrot in the cage said, yes, tell them, I am enjoying myself in my cage. I am eating, drinking. I take churi and mirich, you don't understand. And I am having a good time eating, drinking, dancing, singing in my cage. So I'm mean, happy. So the merchant went and in due course of time, he reached that forest from where he had picked up this bird and he saw many other parrots. So he called them, come here, I have a message for you. So all the parrots gathered around him and he said, you remember last year, I took one of the parrots from here. I put in a cage and took it to India. That parrot has sent you a message. He says he's having a good time eating, drinking, singing, ma making merry in his cage and he's happy. When he said this, one parrot sitting on a branch of a tree got tears in his eyes and dropped down dead. Sad, saddened by this event, the merchant went back to India and he told the parrot in his own cage, he says, look, I gave your message to the folks back home. I told those parrots that you are having a good time 
eating, drinking and enjoying your life in the cage. But when I said this, one parrot who must be very dear to you, he had uh, uh, tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. When the merchant said this, the parrot in the cage got tears in his eyes and fell down dead. So the merchant said these two parrots must have been very close to each other. They could not bear to hear this message. So he took the dead bird out and threw it out from the cage. Upon that, that bird flew up and sat on top of a tree. So the merchant said, you aren't dead at all? After all, you are alive? And the parrot said, yes, so is that parrot in the jungle also alive. He was only sending a message to me through you. And the message was, if you want to get out of this cage, die while living. <laughs> well, that's just a story, but just, it's called a parrot story. And it shows the importance that uh, in Sanskrit they said, mritam tavil matram, that means dying before dying, is the, call, is the secret of this. St. Paul says, I die daily. The idea is that you have to experience <coughs> physical, a form of withdrawal of consciousness from the physical body, so that you can have access to the higher spirituality. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this whole day, this workshop as much as I have. I have been very happy to spend time with you and to see some of the very devoted seekers amongst you, very serious students of this path of the master's path of spirituality. And I'm sure that you'll make a lot of headway in your spiritual life if you keep on following the spiritual traditions of going within and finding the truth within. Don't be misled by people who show you things outside. Outside is all trash. If there is something worthwhile outside, it is that which shows you the path inside. And that is a perfect living master. That's a true friend who can give you this path. Otherwise, things outside are not worth our love and our attention. They are worth doing our duties because we are born to do our duties. We have got our karma. Our karma is put in touch with the same people. We have done something to them before. We hurt somebody, that person has come to hurt us. We have been good to somebody, they have come back here in this life to give us our reward. Well, accept what is our duty. Do your duty fully, courageously, bravely. The spiritual path does not want us to be cowards. We should do things bravely and strongly. Whatever has to be done, has to be done. But do it as your duty to do in this world with everybody. All relationships are our duty and do them appropriately. But the real love and the real attachment should be to the spiritual master within. And then we'll make headway back home. I hope uh, you will enjoy your spiritual journey like you are enjoying your trips here. Thank you very much. This ends the workshop.